the amana community eighteen seventy four from the communistic societies of the united states by charles nordhoff this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The name we took out of the Bible, said one of the officers of the society to me. They put the accent on the first syllable. The name occurs in the Song of Solomon, the fourth chapter and eighth verse. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Shinir and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. A manna in Iowa, however, is not a mountain, but an extensive plain upon which they have built seven villages, conveniently placed so as to command the cultivated land, and to form an irregular circle within their possessions. In these villages all the people live and are thus divided. A manna, population 450, its business woolen mill saw and grist mill and farming east amana population one hundred twenty five farming middle amana population three fifty woolen mill and farming amana near the hill population one hundred twenty five farming sawmill and tannery west amana one hundred fifty grist mill and farming South Amana, 150, Sawmill and Farming, Homestead, Population 135, Railroad Station, a Sawmill, Farming, and General Depot. The villages lie about a mile and a half apart, and each has a store at which the neighboring farmers trade, and a tavern or inn for the accommodation of the general public. Each village has also its shoemakers, carpenters, tailors, and other shops, for they aim to produce and make, as far as possible, all that they use. In Middle Amana there is a printing office where their books are made. The villages consist usually of one straggling street, outside of which lie the barns and the mills, factories and workshops. The houses are well built, of brick, stone, or wood, very plain, each with a sufficient garden, but mostly standing immediately on the street. They use no paint, believing that the wood lasts as well without. There is usually a narrow sidewalk of boards or brick, and the schoolhouse and church are notable buildings, only because of their greater size like the quakers they abhor steeple houses and their church architecture is of the plainest the barns and other farm buildings are roomy and convenient on the boundaries of a village are usually a few houses inhabited by hired laborers each family has a house for itself though when a young couple marry they commonly go to live with the parents of one or the other for some years as you walk through a village, you notice that at irregular intervals are houses somewhat larger than the rest. These are either cook houses or prayer houses. The people eat in common, but for convenience's sake they are divided so that a certain number eat together. For a manna, which has 450 people, there are 15 such cooking and eating houses in these the young women are employed to work under the supervision of matrons and hither when the bell rings come those who are appointed to eat at each the sexes sitting at separate tables and the children also by themselves why do you separate men from women at table i asked to prevent silly conversation and trifling conduct was the answer Food is distributed to the houses according to the number of persons eating in each. Meal and milk are brought to the doors, and each cooking house is required to make its own butter and cheese. For those whom illness or the care of small children keeps at home, the food is placed in neat baskets, and it was a curious sight to see, when the dinner bell rang, 
a number of women walking rapidly about the streets with these baskets each nicely packed with food when the bell ceases ringing and all are assembled they stand up in their places in silence for half a minute then one says grace and when he ends all say god bless and keep us safely and then sit down there is but little conversation at table the meal is eaten rapidly but with decorum and at its close all stand up again some one gives thanks and thereupon they file out with quiet order and precision they live well after the hearty german fashion and bake excellent bread the table is clean but it has no cloth the dishes are coarse but neat and the houses while well built and possessing all that is absolutely essential to comfort according to the german peasant's idea have not always carpets and have often a bed in what new englanders would call the parlor and in general are for use and not ornament they breakfast between six and half past six according to the season have supper between six and seven and dinner at half past eleven they have besides an afternoon lunch of bread and butter and coffee and in summer a forenoon lunch of bread to which they add beer or wine both homemade they do not forbid tobacco each business has its foreman and these leaders in each village meet together every evening to concert and arrange the labors of the following day thus if any department needs for an emergency an extra force it is known and the proper persons are warned the trustees select the temporal foreman and give to each from time to time his proper charge appointing him also his helpers thus a member showed me his ticket by which he was appointed to the care of the cows with the names of those who were to assist him in the summer and when the work requires it a large force is turned into the fields and the women labor with the men in the harvest the workmen in the factories are of course not often changed the children are kept at school between the ages of six and thirteen the sexes do not sit in separate rooms the school opens at seven o'clock and the children study and recite until half past nine from that hour until eleven when they are dismissed for dinner they knit gloves wristlets or stockings at one o'clock school reopens and they once more attend to lessons until three from which hour till half past four they knit again the teachers are men but they are relieved by women when the labor school begins boys as well as girls are required to knit one of the teachers said to me that this work kept them quiet gave them habits of industry and kept them off the streets and from rude plays they instruct the children in musical notation but do not allow musical instruments they give only the most elementary instruction the three r's but give also constant drill in the bible and in the catechism why should we let our youth study we need no lawyers or preachers we have already three doctors what they need is to live holy lives to learn god's commandments out of the bible to learn submission to his will and to love him the dress of the people is plain the men wear in the winter a vest which buttons close up to the throat coat and trousers being of the common cut the women and young girls wear dingy colored stuffs mostly of the society's own make cut in the plainest style and often short gowns in the german peasant way all even to the very small girls wear their hair in a kind of black cowl or cap which covers only the back of the head and is tied under the chin by a black ribbon also all young as well as old wear a small dark colored shawl or handkerchief over the shoulders and pinned very plainly across the breast this peculiar uniform adroitly conceals the marks of sex 
and gives a singularly monotonous appearance to the women the sex i believe is not highly esteemed by these people who think it dangerous to the christian's peace of mind one of their most esteemed writers advises men to fly from intercourse with women as a very highly dangerous magnet and magical fire their women work hard and dress soberly all ornaments are forbidden to wear the hair loose is prohibited great care is used to keep the sexes apart in their evening and other meetings women not only sit apart from men but they leave the room before the men break ranks boys are allowed to play only with boys and girls with girls there are no places or occasions for evening amusements where the sexes might meet on sunday afternoons the boys are permitted to walk in the fields and so are the girls but these must go in another direction perhaps they meet in the course of the walk said a member to me but it is not allowed at meals and in their labors they are also separated with all this care to hide the charms of the young women to make them as far as dress can do so look old and ugly and to keep the young men away from them love courtship and marriage go on at amana as elsewhere in the world the young man falls in love and finds ways to make his passion known to his object he no doubt enjoys all the delights of courtship intensified by the difficulties which his prudent brethren put in his way and he marries the object of his affection in spite of her black hood and her sad colored little shawl whenever he has reached the age of twenty-four before that age he may not marry even if his parents consent this is a merely prudential rule they have few cares in life and would marry too early for their own good food and lodging being secured them if there were not a rule upon the subject so said one of their wise men to me therefore no matter how early the young people agree to marry the wedding is deferred until the man reaches the proper age and when at last the wedding day comes it is treated with a degree of solemnity which is calculated to make it a day of terror rather than of unmitigated delight the parents of the bride and groom meet with two or three of the elders at the house of the bride's father here after singing and prayer that chapter of paul's writings is read wherein with great plainness of speech he describes to the ephesians and the christian world in general the duties of husband and wife on this chapter the elders comment with great thoroughness to the young people and for a long time as i was told and after this lecture and more singing and prayer there is a modest supper whereupon all retire quietly to their homes the strictly pious hold that marriages should be made only by consent of god signified through the inspired instrument while the married state has thus the countenance and sanction of the society and its elders matrimony is not regarded as a meritorious act it has in it they say a certain large degree of worldliness it is not calculated to make them more but rather less spiritually minded so think they at amana and accordingly the religious standing of the young couple suffers and is lowered in the amana church there are three classes orders or grades the highest consisting of those members who have manifested in their lives the greatest spirituality and piety now if the new married couple should have belonged for years to this highest class their wedding would put them down into the lowest or the children's order for a year or two until they had won their slow way back by deepening piety the civil or temporal government of the amana community consists of thirteen trustees chosen annually by the male members of the society 
the president of the society is chosen by the trustees this body manages the finances and carries on the temporalities generally but it acts only with the unanimous consent of its members the trustees live in different villages but exercise no special authority as i understand as individuals the foremen and elders in each village carry on the work and keep the accounts each village keeps its own books and manages its own affairs but all accounts are finally sent to the headquarters at amana where they are inspected and the balance of profit or loss is discovered it is supposed that the labor of each village produces a profit but whether it does or not makes no difference in the supplies of the people who receive everything alike as all property is held in common all accounts are balanced once a year and thus the productiveness of every industry is ascertained the elders are a numerous body not necessarily old men but presumably men of deep piety and spirituality they are named or appointed by inspiration and preside at religious assemblies in every village four or five of the older and more experienced elders meet each morning to advise together on business this council acts as i understand upon reports of those younger elders who are foremen and have charge of different affairs these in turn meet for a few minutes every evening and arrange for the next day's work women are never members of these councils nor do they hold as far as i could discover any temporal or spiritual authority with the single exception of their present spiritual head who is a woman of eighty years moreover if a man should marry out of the society and his wife should desire to become a member the husband is expelled for a year at the end of which time both may make application to come in if they wish they have contrived a very simple and ingenious plan for supplying their members with clothing and other articles aside from food to each adult male an annual allowance is made of from forty to one hundred dollars according to his position and labor necessitates more or less clothing for each adult female the allowance is from twenty five to thirty dollars and from five to ten dollars for each child all that they need is kept in store in each village and is sold to the members at cost and expenses when any one requires an article of clothing he goes to the store and selects the cloth for which he is charged in a book he brings with him he then goes to the tailor who makes the garment and charges him on the book an established price if he needs shoes or a hat or tobacco or a watch everything is in the same way charged as i sat in one of the shops i noticed women coming in to make purchases often bringing children with them and each had her little book in which due entry was made whatever we do not use is so much saved against next year or we may give it away if we like one explained to me and added that during the war when the society contributed between eighteen and twenty thousand dollars to various benevolent purposes much of this was given by individual members out of the savings on their year's account almost every man has a watch but they keep a strict rule over vanities of apparel and do not allow the young girls to buy or wear earrings or breastpins the young and unmarried people if they have no parents are divided around among the families they have not many labor-saving contrivances though of course the eating in common is both economical and labor-saving there is in each village a general wash-house where the clothing of the unmarried people is washed but each family does its own washing they have no libraries and most of their reading is in the bible and in their own inspired records 
which as i shall show further on are quite voluminous a few newspapers are taken and each calling among them receives the journal which treats of its own specialty in general they aim to withdraw themselves as much as possible from the world and take little interest in public affairs during the war they voted but we do not now for we do not like the turn politics have taken which seemed to me a curious reason for refusing to vote their members came originally from many parts of germany and switzerland they have also a few pennsylvania dutch they have much trouble with applicants who desire to join the society and receive the secretary told me sometimes dozens of letters in a month from persons of whom they know nothing and not a few of whom it seems write not to ask permission to join but to say they are coming on at once there have been cases where a man wrote to say that he had sold all his possessions and was then on the way with his family to join the association as they claim to be not an industrial but a religious community they receive new members with great care and only after thorough investigation of motives and religious faith and these random applications are very annoying to them most of their new members they receive from germany accepting them after proper correspondence and under the instructions of inspiration where they believe them worthy they do not inquire about their means and a fund is annually set apart by the trustees to pay the passage of poor families whom they have determined to take in usually a neophyte enters on probation for two years signing an obligation to labor faithfully to conduct himself according to the society's regulations and to demand no wages if at the close of his probation he appears to be a proper person he is admitted to full membership and if he has property he is then expected to put this into the common stock signing also the constitution which provides that on leaving he shall have his contribution returned but without interest there are cases however where a newcomer is at once admitted to full membership this is where inspiration directs such breach of the general rule on the ground that the applicant is already a fit person most of their members came from the lutheran church but they also have catholics and i believe several jews they employ about two hundred hired hands mostly in agricultural labors and these are all germans many of whom have families for these they supply houses and give them sometimes the privilege of raising a few cattle on their land they are excellent farmers and keep fine stock which they care for with german thoroughness stall feeding in the winter the members do not work hard one of the foremen told me that three hired hands could do as much as five or six of the members partly this comes no doubt from the interruption to steady labor caused by their frequent religious meetings but i have found it generally true that the members of communistic societies take life easy the people are of varying degrees of intelligence but most of them belong to the peasant class of germany and were originally farmers weavers or mechanics they are quiet a little stolid and very well satisfied with their life here as in other communistic societies the brains seem to come easily to the top the leading men with whom i conversed appeared to me to be thoroughly trained businessmen in the german fashion men of education too and a good deal of intelligence the present secretary told me that he had been during all his early life a merchant in germany and he had the grave and somewhat precise air of an honest german merchant of the old style prudent with a heavy sense of responsibility a little rigid and yet kindly 
at the little inn i talked with a number of the rank and file and noticed in them great satisfaction with their method of life they were on the surface the commoner kind of german laborers but they had evidently thought pretty thoroughly upon the subject of communal living and knew how to display to me what appeared to them its advantages in their society the absolute equality of all men as god made us the security for their families the abundance of food and the independence of a master it seems to me that these advantages are dearer to the germans than to almost any other nation and hence they work more harmoniously in communistic experiments i think i noticed at amana and elsewhere among the german communistic societies a satisfaction in their lives a pride in the equality which the communal system secures and also in the conscious surrender of the individual will to the general good which is not so clearly and satisfactorily felt among other nationalities moreover the german peasant is fortunate in his tastes which are frugal and well fitted for community living he has not a great sense of or desire for beauty of surroundings he likes substantial living but cares nothing for elegance his comforts are not like the americans of a costly kind i think too that his lower passions are more easily regulated or controlled and certainly he is more easily contented to remain in one place the innkeeper a little to my surprise when by chance i told him that i had spent a winter on the sandwich islands asked me with the keenest delight and curiosity about the trees the climate and the life there and wanted to know if i had seen the place where captain cook the great circumnavigator of the world was slain he returned to the subject again and again and evidently looked upon me as a prodigiously interesting person because i had been fortunate enough to see what to him was classic ground an american would not have felt one half this man's interest but he would probably have dreamed of making the same journey some day my kindly host sat serenely in his place and was not moved by a single wandering thought they forbid all amusements all cards and games whatever and all musical instruments one might have a flute but nothing more also they regard photographs and pictures of all kinds as tending to idol worship and therefore not to be allowed they have made very substantial improvements upon their property among other things in order to secure a sufficient water power they dug a canal six miles long and from five to ten feet deep leading a large body of water through a manna on this canal they keep a steam scow to dredge it out annually as a precaution against fire in a manna there is a little tower upon a house in the middle of the village where two men keep watch all night they buy much wool from the neighboring farmers and have a high reputation for integrity and simple plain dealing among their neighbors a farmer told me that it was not easy to cheat them and that they never dealt the second time with a man who had in any way wronged them but that they paid a fair price for all they bought and always paid cash in their woolen factories they make cloth enough for their own wants and to supply the demand of the country about them flannels and yarn as well as woolen gloves and stockings they export sending some of these products as far as new york the gloves and stockings are made not only by the children but by the women during the winter months when they are otherwise unemployed at present they own about three thousand sheep fifteen hundred head of cattle two hundred horses and twenty five hundred hogs the society has no debt and has a considerable fund at interest 
they lose very few of their young people some who leave them return after a few years in the world plain and dull as the life is it appears to satisfy the youth they train up and no doubt it has its rewards in its regularity peacefulness security against want and freedom from dependence on a master it struck me as odd that in cases of illness they use chiefly homeopathic treatment the people lived to a hale old age they had among the members in march eighteen seventy four a woman aged ninety seven and a number of persons over eighty they are non-resistants but during the late war paid for substitutes in the army but we did wrongly there said one to me it is not right to take part in wars even in this way to sum up the people of amana appeared to me a remarkably quiet industrious and contented population honest of good repute among their neighbors very kindly and with religion so thoroughly and largely made a part of their lives that they may be called a religious people end of the amana community eighteen seventy four from the communistic societies of the united states by charles nordhoff read by sue anderson the babies by mark twain this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. delivered at the banquet in chicago given by the army of tennessee to their first commander general u s grant november eighteen seventy nine the fifteenth regular toast was the babies as they comfort us in our sorrows let us not forget them in our festivities i like that we have not all had the good fortune to be ladies we have not all been generals or poets or statesmen but when the toast works down to the babies we stand on common ground it is a shame that for a thousand years the world's banquets have utterly ignored the baby as if he didn't amount to anything if you will stop and think a minute if you will go back fifty or one hundred years to your early married life and recontemplate your first baby you will remember that he amounted to a good deal and even something over you soldiers all know that when that little fellow arrived at family headquarters you had to hand in your resignation he took entire command you became his lackey his mere body servant and you had to stand around too he was not a commander who made allowances for time distance weather or anything else you had to execute his order whether it was possible or not and there was only one form of marching in his manual of tactics and that was the double quick he treated you with every sort of insolence and disrespect and the bravest of you didn't dare to say a word you could face the death storm at donelson and vicksburg and give back blow for blow but when he clawed your whiskers and pulled your hair and twisted your nose you had to take it when the thunders of war were sounding in your ears you set your faces toward the batteries and advanced with steady tread but when he turned on the terrors of his war hoop you advanced in the other direction and mighty glad of the chance too when he called for soothing syrup 
did you venture to throw out any side remarks about certain services being unbecoming an officer and a gentleman no you got up and got it when he ordered his pap bottle and it was not warm did you talk back not you you went to work and warmed it you even descended so far in your menial office as to take a suck at that warm insipid stuff yourself to see if it was right three parts water to one of milk a touch of sugar to modify the colic and a drop of peppermint to kill those immortal hiccups i can taste that stuff yet and how many things you learned as you went along sentimental young folks still take stock in that beautiful old saying that when the baby smiles in his sleep it is because the angels are whispering to him very pretty but too thin simply wind on the stomach my friends if the baby proposed to take a walk at his usual hour two o'clock in the morning didn't you rise up promptly and remark with a mental addition that would not improve a sunday school book much that that was the very thing you were about to propose yourself oh you were under good discipline and as you went fluttering up and down the room in your undress uniform you not only prattled undignified baby talk but even tuned up your martial voices and tried to sing rockabye baby in the treetop for instance what a spectacle for an army of the tennessee and what an affliction for the neighbors too for it is not everybody within a mile around that likes military music at three in the morning and when you had been keeping this sort of thing up two or three hours and your little velvet head intimated that nothing suited him like exercise and noise what did you do you simply went on until you dropped in the last ditch the idea that a baby doesn't amount to anything why one baby is just a house and a front yard full by itself one baby can furnish more business than you and your whole interior department can attend to he is enterprising irrepressible brimful of lawless activities do what you please you can't make him stay on the reservation sufficient unto the day is one baby as long as you are in your right mind don't you ever pray for twins twins amount to a permanent riot and there ain't any real difference between triplets and an insurrection yes it was high time for a toastmaster to recognize the importance of the babies think what is in store for the present crop Fifty years from now we shall all be dead, I trust. And then this flag, if it still survive, and let us hope it may, will be floating over a republic numbering two hundred million souls, according to the settled laws of our increase. Our present schooner of state will have grown into a political leviathan, a great eastern, the cradled babies of today will be on deck. Let them be well trained, for we are going to leave a big contract on their hands. Among the three or four million cradles now rocking in the land are some which this nation would preserve for ages as sacred things, if we could know which ones they are. In one of these cradles, the unconscious farragut of the future is at this moment teething, think of it, and putting in a world of dead earnest, unarticulated, but perfectly justifiable profanity over it, too. In another, the future renowned astronomer is blinking at the shining Milky Way with but a languid interest, poor little chap 
and wondering what has become of that other one they call the wet nurse. In another, the future great historian is lying, and doubtless will continue to lie until his earthly mission is ended. In another, the future president is busying himself with no profounder problem of state than what the mischief has become of his hair so early. And in a mighty array of other cradles, there are now some 60,000 future office seekers getting ready to furnish him occasion to grapple with that same old problem a second time. And in still one more cradle, somewhere under the flag, the future illustrious commander-in-chief of the american armies is so little burdened with his approaching grandeurs and responsibilities as to be giving his whole strategic mind at this moment to trying to find out some way to get his big toe into his mouth an achievement which meaning no disrespect the illustrious guest of this evening turned his entire attention to some fifty-six years ago. And if the child is but a prophecy of the man, there are mighty few who will doubt that he succeeded. End of the Babies by Mark Twain Read by Tom Merritt A Defense of Rash Vows From The Defendant by G. K. Chesterton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. If a prosperous modern man, with a high hat and a frock coat, were to solemnly pledge himself before all his clerks and friends, to count the leaves on every third tree in Holland Walk, to hop up to the city on one leg every Thursday, to repeat the whole of Mill's Liberty seventy-six times, to collect three hundred dandelions, in fields belonging to any one of the name Brown, to remain for thirty-one hours holding his left ear in his right hand, to sing the names of all his aunts in order of age on the top of an omnibus, or make any such unusual undertaking, we should immediately conclude that the man was mad, or, as it is sometimes expressed, was an artist in life. Yet these vows are not more extraordinary than the vows which in the Middle Ages and in similar periods were made, not by fanatics merely, but by the greatest figures in civic and national civilization, by kings, judges, poets, and priests. One man swore to chain two mountains together, and the great chain hung there, it was said, for ages as a monument of that mystical folly. Another swore that he would find his way to Jerusalem with a patch over his eyes, and died looking for it. It is not easy to see that these two exploits, judged from a strictly rational standpoint, are any saner than the acts above suggested. A mountain is commonly a stationary and reliable object, which it is not necessary to chain up at night like a dog. And it is not easy, at first sight, to see that a man pays a very high compliment to the holy city, by setting out for it under conditions which render it to the last degree improbable that he will ever get there. But about this there is one striking thing to be noticed. If men behaved in that way in our time, we should, as we have said, regard them as symbols of the decadence. But the men who did these things were not decadent. They belonged generally to the most robust classes of what is generally regarded as a robust age. Again, it will be urged, that if men essentially sane performed such insanities, it was under the capricious direction of a superstitious religious system. This again will not hold water, for in the purely terrestrial and even sensual departments of life, such as love and lust, the medieval princes show the same mad promises and performances, the same misshapen imagination, and the same monstrous self-sacrifice. Here we have a contradiction, to explain which it is necessary to think of the whole nature of vows from the beginning. And if we consider, seriously and correctly, the nature of vows, we shall, unless I am much mistaken, come to the conclusion that it is perfectly sane, and even sensible, to swear to chain mountains together, 
and that if insanity is involved at all, it is a little insane not to do so. The man who makes a vow makes an appointment with himself at some distant time or place. The danger of it is that himself should not keep the appointment. And in modern times this terror of one's self, of the weakness and mutability of one's self, has perilously increased, and is the real basis of the objection to vows of any kind. A modern man refrains from swearing to count the leaves on every third tree in Holland Walk, not because it is silly to do so, he does many sillier things, but because he has a profound conviction that before he had got to the three hundred and seventy-ninth leaf on the first tree, he would be excessively tired of the subject and want to go home to tea. In other words, we fear that by that time he will be, in the common but hideously significant phrase, another man. Now, it is this horrible fairy tale of a man constantly changing into other men that is the soul of the decadence. That John Patterson should, with apparent calm, look forward to being a certain General Barker on Monday, Dr. MacGregor on Tuesday, Sir Walter Carstairs on Wednesday, and Sam Slug on Thursday, may seem a nightmare. But to that nightmare we give the name of modern culture. One great decadent, who is now dead, published a poem some time ago, in which he powerfully summed up the whole spirit of the movement by declaring that he could stand in the prison yard and entirely comprehend the feelings of a man about to be hanged. For he that lives more lives than one, more deaths than one must die. And the end of all this is that maddening horror of unreality which descends upon the decadence, and compared with which physical pain itself would have the freshness of a youthful thing. The one hell which imagination must conceive as most hellish is to be eternally acting a play, without even the narrowest and dirtiest green room in which to be human. And this is the condition of the decadent, of the asthete, of the free lover. To be everlastingly passing through dangers which we know cannot scathe us, to be taking oaths which we know cannot bind us, to be defying enemies who we know cannot conquer us. This is the grinning tyranny of decadence which is called freedom. Let us turn, on the other hand, to the maker of vows. The man who made a vow, however wild, gave a healthy and natural expression to the greatness of a great moment. He vowed, for example, to chain two mountains together, perhaps a symbol of some great relief, or love, or aspiration. Short as the moment of his resolve might be, it was, like all great moments, a moment of immortality, and the desire to say of it, Exegi monumentum ere perennis, was the only sentiment that would satisfy his mind. The modern aesthetic man would, of course, easily see the emotional opportunity, he would vow to chain two mountains together. But then, he would quite as cheerfully vow to chain the earth to the moon and the withering consciousness that he did not mean what he said, that he was, in truth, saying nothing of any great import, would take from him exactly that sense of daring actuality which is the excitement of a vow. For what could be more maddening than an existence in which our mother or aunt received the information that we were going to assassinate the king, or build a temple on Ben Nevis, with the genial composure of custom? The revolt against vows has been carried in our day even to the extent of a revolt against the typical vow of marriage. It is most amusing to listen to the opponents of marriage on this subject. They appear to imagine that the ideal of constancy was a yoke, mysteriously imposed on mankind by the devil, instead of being, as it is, a yoke consistently imposed by all lovers on themselves. They have invented a phrase a phrase that is a black-and-white contradiction in two words, free love, as if a lover ever had been, or ever could be, free. It is the nature of love to bind itself, and the institution of marriage merely paid the average man the compliment of taking him at his word. Modern sages offer to the lover, 
with an ill-flavoured grin, the largest liberties and the fullest irresponsibility. But they do not respect him as the old church respected him, they do not write his oath upon the heavens as the record of his highest moment. They give him every liberty except the liberty to sell his liberty, which is the only one he wants. In Mr. Bernard Shaw's brilliant play, The Philanderer, we have a vivid picture of this state of things. Charteris is a man perpetually endeavouring to be a free lover, which is like endeavouring to be a married bachelor or a white negro. He is wandering in a hungry search for a certain exhilaration which he can only have when he has the courage to cease from wandering. Men knew better than this in old times, in the time, for example, of Shakespeare's heroes. When Shakespeare's men are really celibate, they praise the undoubted advantages of celibacy, liberty, irresponsibility, a chance of continual change. But they were not such fools as to continue to talk of liberty when they were in such a condition that they could be made happy or miserable by the moving of someone else's eyebrow. Suckling classes love with debt in his praise of freedom. And he that's fairly out of both, of all the world is blessed. He lives as in the golden age, when all things made were common. He takes his pipe, he takes his glass, he fears no man or woman. This is a perfectly possible, rational, and manly position. But what have lovers to do with ridiculous affectations of fearing no man or woman? They know that in the turning of a hand, the whole cosmic engine to the remotest star may become an instrument of music or an instrument of torture. They hear a song older than Suckling's, that has survived a hundred philosophies. Who is this that looketh out of the window, fair as the sun, clear as the moon, terrible as an army with banners? As we have said, it is exactly this back door, this sense of having a retreat behind us, that is, to our minds, the sterilising spirit in modern pleasure. Everywhere there is the persistent and insane attempt to obtain pleasure without paying for it. Thus, in politics, the modern jingoes practically say, Let us have the pleasures of conquerors without the pains of soldiers. Let us sit on sofas and be a hardy race. Thus in religion and morals, the decadent mystics say, Let us have the fragrance of sacred purity without the sorrows of self-restraint. Let us sing hymns alternately to the Virgin and Priapus. Thus in love the free lovers say, Let us have the splendour of offering ourselves, without the peril of committing ourselves. Let us see whether one cannot commit suicide an unlimited number of times. Emphatically it will not work. There are thrilling moments, doubtless, for the spectator, the amateur, and the asthete. But there is one thrill that is known only to the soldier who fights for his own flag, to the ascetic who starves himself for his own illumination, to the lover who makes finally his own choice. And it is this transfiguring self-discipline that makes the vow a truly sane thing. It must have satisfied even the giant hunger of the soul of a lover or a poet to know that in consequence of some one instant of decision that strange chain would hang for centuries in the Alps, among the silences of stars and snows. All around us is the city of small sins, abounding in backways and retreats. But surely, sooner or later, the towering flame will rise from the harbour, announcing that the reign of the cowards is over, and a man is burning his ships. End of A Defence of Rash Vows by G. K. Chesterton Recording by Corey Samuel The Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. By the President of the United States of America. A Proclamation. Whereas on the 22nd day of September, A.D. 1862, a proclamation was issued by the President of the United States, containing, among other things, the following. 
to wit. That on the first day of January, A.D. 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons, and will do no act or acts to repress such persons, or any of them, in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. That the executive will, on the first day of January aforesaid, by proclamation, designate the states and parts of states, if any, in which the people thereof, respectively, shall then be in rebellion against the United States, and the fact that any state or the people thereof shall on that day be in good faith represented in the Congress of the United States by members chosen thereto at elections, wherein a majority of the qualified voters of such states shall have participated, shall, in the absence of strong countervailing testimony, be deemed conclusive evidence that such state and the people thereof are not then in rebellion against the United States. Now, therefore, I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, by virtue of the power in me vested as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States, in time of actual armed rebellion against the authority and government of the United States, and as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion, do, on this first day of January, A.D. 1863, and in accordance with my purpose to do so, publicly proclaimed for the full period of one hundred days from the first day above mentioned, order and designate as the states and parts of states wherein the people thereof respectively are this day in rebellion against the United States, the following, to wit. Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, except the parishes of St. Bernard, Palquemines, Jefferson, St. John, St. Charles, St. James, Ascension, Assumption, Terrebonne, Lafourche, St. Mary, St. Martin, and Orleans, including the city of New Orleans, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia, except the 48 counties designated as West Virginia, and also the counties of Berkeley, Acomac, Northampton, Elizabeth City, York, Princess Anne, and Norfolk, including the cities of Norfolk and Portsmouth, and which accepted parts are for the present left precisely as if this proclamation were not issued. And by virtue of the power and for the purpose aforesaid, I do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states and parts of states are, and henceforth shall be, free, and that the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authorities thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons. And I hereby enjoin upon the people so declared to be free to abstain from all violence, unless in necessary self-defense. And I recommend to them that in all case, when allowed, they labor faithfully for reasonable wages. And I further declare and make known that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and to man vessels of all sorts in said service. And upon this act, sincerely believed to be an act of justice, warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity, I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God. End of the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln Read by Winston Tharp Farming with Dynamite by E. I. Dupont de Moore's Powder Company. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Farming with Dynamite A Few Hints to Farmers. 
saves money, time, labor. Removes stumps, boulders, hard pan. Ensures new rich soil, increased acreage, easy plowing, bigger yields. What is dynamite? Some farmers have a wrong idea about dynamite. They know it is a powerful explosive and believe it is dangerous to handle. Dynamite is very powerful, much more so than gunpowder, but is actually safer to handle. After more than a hundred years' experience in making and using explosives, we can truthfully state that by following simple directions with ordinary care, anyone can use our Red Cross Dynamite without harm. The purpose of this booklet is to tell you the wonderful value of the use of Red Cross Dynamite on the farm. If it interests you, as it surely will, and if you are progressive and ambitious, write for a copy of our Handbook of Explosives for Farmers, Planters, and Ranchers, which will be sent free of charge, and which tells just how to use Red Cross Dynamite safely and easily, and make it the greatest aid to profitable farming. We will be glad to correspond with you about any special requirements of your farm, or give you any information you want. Write our nearest office, and your letter will receive prompt personal attention. Chief Uses of Dynamite on the Farm As farmers all over the country begin to understand the value of Red Cross Dynamite in their work, they are constantly reporting new uses for this powerful assistant. The chief uses are mentioned below, and are explained in detail further on. Complete instructions are furnished in the Handbook of Explosives for Farmers, Planters, and Ranchers. Clearing land of stumps, trees, and boulders. Breaking up hard pan, shale, or clay subsoils. Plowing. Planting and cultivating orchards. Digging ditches, post holes, wells, and reservoirs. Road making and grading. Excavating cellars and foundation trenches. Regenerating old, worn-out farms. Clearing land of stumps, boulders, and trees. It is needless to tell you the advantages of clearing land. The stump-covered site of a former piece of woods is, as you know, new, rich soil that needs no fertilizer. You also know that pulling stumps with a machine is the hardest kind of work, liable to injure seriously your horses, and certain to require a lot of work to get rid of the stump after pulling. Then, too, it leaves the field full of holes that must be filled, and plowing the hard-packed soil around old roots is no joke. If, instead of pulling the stumps, you burn them out, the intense heat required destroys the chief fertile elements of the soil all around the fire. After all your hard work, you will leave a burned field instead of new fertile soil. You can dynamite all those stumps for about one-third the cost of pulling and chopping them up. The blast splits up the stump into firewood, removes all the dirt, breaks all the main roots, and loosens the soil for yards around. You can blast 50 stumps in the time it would take to pull and chop up one or two. One man can do all the work if necessary. After the stumps are all pulled out, you will have a new, rich field and easy to cultivate, requiring no fertilizer to yield bumper crops. If you want to remove a whole tree, Red Cross Dynamite will lift it bodily out of the ground and it will usually fall with the wind. When this is done, there is no stump left to remove. Boulders, which you are now obligated to plow around, can be broken up into easily handled blocks by a single blast. What it costs to blast out stumps. At the latest Farming with Dynamite demonstration, held under the auspices of the Norfolk and Western Railroad at Ivor, Virginia, on August 11, 1910, one and a half acres containing 46 stumps were cleared in one day at an expense of $18 including labor, or an average of 39 cents per stump. Records kept by the Long Island Railroad, covering operations on their experimental farm, showed that, including the wages of the men who did the work, the cost of blasting out stumps averaged about 16 cents per stump. Records kept in the cost of this work in different sections of the country show as follows. Locality and kind of stump, average diameter, average cost per stump. Southern pine stumps, 29 inches, 30 cents. Pennsylvania, apple, ash, and chestnut, 34 and a half inches, 56 cents. Michigan, white pine, maple, and birch, 32 inches, 47 cents. Minnesota, 
Birch, ash, spruce, and pine, 20 inches, 16 cents. Illinois, oak, walnut, and gum, 30 inches, 53 cents. Western, fir, pine, and cedar, 50 inches, $1.13. Redwood, 8 feet and over, $2 and over. Records kept by Professor A. J. McGuire, Superintendent, Experimental Farm of the University of Minnesota, show even lower costs. Breaking up hard pan, shale, or clay soils. This is probably the most important use of Red Cross Dynamite. It is possible, although difficult and expensive, to clear land of stumps and boulders in other ways, but it is not possible to break up hard pan or clay subsoils without the use of Red Cross Dynamite. Land that has a waterproof subsoil is practically worthless, as it holds the surface water in such quantities on level ground that the roots of trees and plants are rotted away. On hilly ground, it allows the surface water to run off, thus preventing the storage of moisture, with the result that vegetation dies quickly in hot weather. Such land can be rendered fertile at once by blasting with Red Cross dynamite. The subsoil is completely broken up, and the dry, dead topsoil converted into a rich loam for less than the amount of the taxes for a year or two. The following extract from the Topeka, Kansas, Mail and Breeze provides the wonderful results of this use of dynamite. A few years ago, M.T. Williams bought a quarter section of land near Medicine Lodge in Barber County, and, conceiving the same idea that ex-Governor Crawford and others have, used dynamite in dealing with a hard subsoil. The land was overgrown with sunflowers and cockleburs and would have been considered dear at $10 per acre. It was underlaid with a hard subsoil that was almost impervious to water. Mr. Williams' idea was to loosen this subsoil with dynamite. He bored holes in the earth some three feet deep and about 40 feet apart, and in each hole placed a part of a stick of dynamite. The explosion of the dynamite loosened the hard subsoil and made a reservoir for the rains, which had formerly run off the land nearly as fast as they fell. In this quarter, there is now a hundred acres of, perhaps, as fine alfalfa as can be found in the state. Mr. Williams has refused $15,000 for the quarter and gathers a net income from his alfalfa of from $30 to $35 per acre every year. Last season, Mr. Williams proposed to the ladies of the Baptist Church that he would give them a load of hay, provided they would come out to the place, shock the hay, load it on the wagons, and haul it to town. They took him at his word and shocked and hauled to town two tons, which sold for $16. When the second crop was ready, the ladies came again and touched Mr. Williams for a little more than two tons, which sold as well as the first load. Plowing with Dynamite Ordinary plowing merely turns over the same old soil year after year, and constant decrease in crops is only prevented by rotation or expensive fertilizing. With Red Cross Dynamite, you can break up the ground all around the field to a depth of two or three feet for less than the cost of adequate fertilizing, and with better results. Fertilizing only improves the topsoil. Dynamiting renders available all the moisture and elements of growth throughout the entire depth of the blast. In an article by J. H. Codwell of Spartansburg, South Carolina, in the September 1910 Technical World Magazine, he states that before the ground was broken up with dynamite, he planted his corn with stalks 18 inches apart in rows 4 feet apart and raised 90 bushels to the acre. After the ground was blasted, it was able to nourish stalks 6 inches apart in rows the same distance apart and to produce over 250 bushels to the acre. This means an increase of about 160 bushels to the acre every year for an original expense of $40 an acre for labor and explosives. F.J. Mullen of Walton County, Georgia, reports that he has been raising crops of watermelons, raising from 50 to 60 pounds each, on land blasted by exploding charges of about 3 ounces of dynamite in holes 2.5 to 3 feet deep, spaced 8 to 10 feet apart. Planting and Cultivating Orchards in the orchard, Red Cross Dynamite not only saves much labor and time in planting the trees, but ensures the best growth and large yields. A man will spend an hour digging a tree hole that dynamite will excavate in an instant. The spaded hole will be hard all the way down, making it difficult for the transplanted roots to take hold. This is one of the chief reasons why transplanted trees so often die. Red Cross Dynamite 
not only excavates the required hole, but also loosens the ground for yards around, killing all grubs and forming a spongy reservoir for moisture. That is why trees planted in dynamited holes live and thrive. A whole row of tree holes can be excavated in one instant when charged with Red Cross dynamite. Old trees are benefited by exploding small charges under them or between the rows. This keeps the ground loose and free from grubs. A well-known fruit grower reports that he planted peach trees some years ago to determine whether anything was to be gained by using dynamite. A number of trees were planted in holes by detonating a charge of explosives to make the holes, and others were planted in holes of the regulation size dug by hand. Three years later, the trees planted in the blasted holes were strong and hardy, each producing between five and six bushels of very fine peaches. The other trees planted on the same ground without blasting bore no peaches, both fruit and leaves having shriveled up and dropped off during the dry season. Digging Ditches post holes, wells, and reservoirs. Excavating of any kind is slow, hard work when done with pick and shovel, especially in mixed ground containing large stones, roots, streaks of gravel, or shale. Several rods of ditch can be excavated in an instant with dynamite, varying the size of each charge according to the nature of the ground at that point. Much of the dirt is thrown out by the blast, and the remainder is broken up ready for the shovel. A Missourian advises us of a ditch he has just blasted through a swamp for $100, which he said would have cost him $500 if dug in the usual way. On August 11, 1910, at the demonstration at Evor, Virginia, above referred to, a ditch 85 feet in length, 3 feet deep, and 4.5 feet wide at the top was blasted with dynamite at a cost not exceeding 10 cents per yard, or about $2.75 for the entire work. Red Cross Dynamite is especially useful in excavating wells and reservoirs, as it opens up all the springs in nearby ground. Road Making and Grading Red Cross Dynamite is a big saver of time and labor in making new roads, or leveling grades on old roads. Rock, shale, clay, gravel, or sand can all be broken up with ease, simply by varying the charge according to the nature of the ground and the depth of excavation desired. Excavating Cellars and Foundation Trenches This work can be done with Red Cross Dynamite in one-tenth the time required for hand or team shoveling, and the cost of the dynamite is but a fraction of the value of the labor saved. Regenerating Old, Worn-Out Farms All over the eastern and southern sections of the United States are farms and plantations once rich, fertile, and profitable, but now either abandoned or so unproductive as to be almost worthless. The chief trouble with these farms is that the topsoil is worked out. Red Cross Dynamite can be used with complete success to turn up an entirely fresh fertile soil and convert a $10 an acre worked out farm into land worth $50 to $100 an acre. The cost in dynamite for this conversion would be about $10 to $15 an acre according to the nature of the soil. This matter is worthy of as much consideration on the part of farmers and all others concerned with natural resources as the reclamation of desert areas in the West. Surely it is as important to restore the productiveness of established farms in the East as it is to open up new fertile lands in the West and Southwest. If any portion of your farm is not productive, it is probable that Red Cross Dynamite can make it productive. The leading railroads of the country are taking the greatest interest in the increasing use of dynamite on the farm because they know by actual results that it means more and better crops, bigger shipments, and greater prosperity all along their lines. Mr. H. B. Fullerton, Director, Agricultural Development of the Long Island Railroad, is one of the pioneers in this movement, and in an article entitled Reclaiming Waste Land on Long Island, his wife, Edith Loring Fullerton, graphically describes the use of dynamite in the preparation of waste land for cultivation. How can we help you? For more than a hundred years, we have been making and selling explosives. We maintain a highly skilled corps of chemists, explosive specialists, and field representatives whose sole duties are to study conditions and devise means for handling them. If there is any soil condition on your farm that we have not mentioned, and which you think might be remedied or improved by dynamite, please write us all about it. There will be no charge for the information we will send you. In fact, we will be much obligated to you for giving us the opportunity to study any peculiar condition. 
Bear in mind that the age, reputation, and high standing of this company are ample assurance that any statements made by us are conservative and based on long and varied experience. In any case, we want you to write for our Handbook of Explosives for Farmers, Planters, and Ranchers, which we will send out only on request, as it is too valuable to send to anyone not interested enough to ask for it. Asking for it puts you under no obligation to us except to read it. We believe that when you have read it, you will understand how simple, safe, and economical the use of Red Cross Dynamite is, and that you will find many ways to save and make money with its aid. E.I. DuPont de Nemours Powder Company, Wilmington, Delaware, November 1910. End of Farming with Dynamite by E.I. DuPont de Nemours Powder Company. Read by Todd. Have Faith in Massachusetts, a collection of speeches and messages by Calvin Coolidge, Governor of Massachusetts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Martin. Have Faith in Massachusetts, Chapter 39, Republican State Convention, Tremont Temple, Boston, October 4, 1919. Ancient custom crystallized to law has drawn us here. We come to renew our pledge publicly at the altar of our country. We come in the light of history and of reason. We come to take counsel both from experience and from imagination. Over us shines a glorious past. Before us lies a promising future. Around us is a renewed determination, deep and solemn, that this commonwealth of ours shall endure. The period since our last election has been one of momentous events. Within its first week the victorious advance of America and her allies terminated in the armistice of November 11th. The power of organized despotisms had been proven to be inferior to the power of organized republics. Reason had again triumphed over absolutism. The, quote, still small voice, unquote, of the moral law was seen to be greater than the might of kings. The world appeal to duty triumphed over the world appeal to selfishness. It always will. There will be far-reaching results from all this, which no one can now foresee. But some things are apparent. The power of the people has been revealed. The worth of the individual man shines forth with an increased glory. But most significant of all, for it lies at the foundation of all civilization and all progress, was the demonstration that the citizens of the great republics of the earth possess the power which they dare to use of maintaining among all men the orderly processes of revealed law. These are no new doctrines in Massachusetts. For nearly three hundred years she has laid her course according to these principles, extending the blessings which arise from them to her citizens, ever ready to defend them with her treasure and her blood. In this the past year has been no exception. In recognition of the long-established policy of making this commonwealth first in humanitarian legislation, the General Court enacted a law providing for reducing a 54-hour week for women and minors to a 48-hour week. It passed the Weaver's Specification Bill. The allowance under the Workmen's Compensation Law was increased Local option was provided on the question of a twelve-hour day for firemen. Authority was granted corporations to give their employees a voice in their management. Representatives of the employees have been appointed to the Board of Trustees of great public service corporations. Profiteering has been made a crime. A special commission, of which the chairman is Brigadier General John H. Sherburne, was established to deal with the problem of the high cost of living, with power which has been effective in reducing the prices of the necessaries of life. No other state has taken any effective measure. 
the compensation of public employees has been increased. The entire public service of the Commonwealth has been reorganized in accordance with the constitutional amendment into twenty departments. In caring for her servicemen, Massachusetts led all the states of the nation in relief and in assistance. Besides voting, the stupendous sum of twenty million dollars, not as compensation, but as recognition of the gratitude due those who had represented us in the great war. The educational opportunities of the youth of the state have been improved. All of these acts of great importance, which are of course only representative of the character of current legislation, had the executive approval. There has been not only a sympathetic, but a very practical attitude toward the ideal expressed in my inaugural address, that there is a right to be well-born, well-reared, well-educated, well-employed, and well-paid. We shall not be shaken in the mature determination to promote these policies. The ancient faith of Massachusetts in the worth of her citizens the cause of great solicitude for the welfare of each individual, will remain undiminished. The many uncertainties in transportation which are state, nation, and worldwide sent our street railway problems to an expert commission which will report to a special session of the general court. It is recognized that the rate of fare necessary to pay for the service rendered has in some instances become prohibitive. Some roads and portions of roads have been closed down. There must be relief. But such relief must be in accord with sound economic principles. What the public has, the public must pay for. From this there is no escape. Under private or public ownership or operation, this rule will be the same. We must face the facts and restore this necessary service to the people in such a form that they can meet its costs. In meeting this issue, not hysterically, not with demagogy, but calmly, with candor, applying an adequate remedy to ascertained facts, Massachusetts, as usual, will lead all the other states of the nation. That agitation and unrest which has been characteristic of the whole world since the close of the war has had some manifestations here. There is a natural desire in every human mind to seek better conditions. Such a desire is altogether praiseworthy. There must, however, be discrimination in the methods employed. Wholesale criticism of everybody and everything does not necessarily exhibit statesmanlike qualities and may not be true. Not all those who are working to better the condition of the people are Bolsheviki or enemies of society. Not all those who are attempting to conduct a successful business are profiteers. But unreasonable criticism and agitation for unreasonable remedies will avail nothing. We, in common with the whole world, are suffering from a shortage of materials. There is but one remedy for this increased production. We need to use sparingly what we have, and make more. No progress will be made by shouting Bolsheviki and profiteers. What we need is thrift and industry. Let everybody keep at work. Profitable employment is the death-blow to Bolshevism, and abundant production is disaster to the profiteer. Our salvation lies in putting forth greater effort in manfully assuming our own burdens, rather than in entertaining the pleasing delusion that they can be shifted to some other shoulders. Those who attempt to lead people on in this expectation only add to their burdens and their dangers. The people of Boston have recently seen the result of agitation and unrest in its police force. The policy of that department, established by an order of former Commissioner O'Meara, and adopted by a rule which has the force of law by the present Commissioner Curtis, prohibited a police union from affiliating with an outside union. In spite of this, such a union was formed, and persisted in, with acknowledged and open defiance of the rules and of the council, and almost entreaties of the officers of the department. 
Such disobedience continuing, the leaders were cited for trial on charges and heard with their counsel before the commissioner. After thorough consideration, an opportunity again to obey the rules, they were found guilty. In order to give a chance to recant, sentence was suspended. Shortly after, three-fourths of the police force abandoned their post and refused further to perform their duties. During the next few hours there was destruction of property in the city, but happily no loss of life. Meantime there had been various efforts to save the situation. Some urged me to remove the commissioner, some to request him to alter his course. To all these I had to reply that I had no authority whatever over his actions and could not lawfully interfere with him. It was my duty to support him in the execution of the law and that I should do. I was glad to confer with any one and give my help where it was sought. The commissioner was appointed by my predecessor in office for a term of years. I could with almost equal propriety interfere in the decisions of the Supreme Court. To restore order, I at once, and by prearrangement with him and the commissioner, offered to the mayor to call out the state guard. At his request I did so, immediately beginning restoring obedience to the law. On account of the public danger, I called on the commissioner to aid me in the execution of my duties of keeping order, and issued a proclamation to that effect. To various suggestions that the police be permitted to return, I replied that the Attorney General had ruled that by law that could not be done, and while I had no power to appoint, discharge, or reinstate, I was opposed to placing the public security again in the keeping of this body of men. There is an obligation to forgive, but it does not extend to the unrepentant. To give them aid and comfort is to support their evil doing, and to become what is known in law as an accessory after the fact. A government which does that is a reproach to civilization, and will soon have on its hands the blood of its citizens. The response to the appeal to support the government of Massachusetts in sustaining law and order was instantaneous. It came from the State Guard, from volunteers for police and the militia, from contributions gathered among all classes now reaching hundreds of thousands of dollars, from the loyal police of Boston, from all quarters of the Commonwealth and beyond. These forces may all be dissipated, they may be defeated, but while I am entrusted with the office of their commander-in-chief they will not be surrendered. Over them and over every other law-abiding citizen has gone up the white flag of Massachusetts. Who is there that by compromising the authority of her laws dares to haul down that flag? I have resisted and propose to continue in resistance to such action. This issue is perfectly plain. The government of Massachusetts is not seeking to resist the lawful action or sound policy of organized labor. It has time and again passed laws for the protection and encouragement of trade unions. It has done so under my administration, upon my recommendation to a greater extent than in any previous year. In that policy it will continue. It is seeking to prevent a condition which would at once destroy all labor unions and all else that is the foundation of civilization by maintaining the authority and sanctity of the law. When that goes, all goes. It costs something, but it is the cheapest thing that can be bought. It causes some inconvenience but it is the foundation of all convenience, the orderly execution of the laws. The people understand this thoroughly. They know that the laws are their laws, and speak their voice. They know that this government is their government, founded on their will, administered by their representatives. Disobedience to it is disobedience to the people. They know that the property of the commonwealth is their property. Destruction of it destroys their substance. The public security is their security. When that is gone, they are in deadly peril. And knowing this, 
the people have a determination to support the government with a resolution that is unchanging. It is my purpose to maintain the government of Massachusetts as it was founded by her people, the protector of the rights of all, but subservient to none. It is my purpose to maintain unimpaired the authority of her laws, her jurisdiction, her peace, her security. This ancient faith of Massachusetts, which became the great faith of America, she re-established in her constitution before the army of Washington had gained our independence, declaring for, quote, a government of laws and not of men, unquote. In that faith she still abides. Let him challenge it who dares. All who love Massachusetts, who believe in America, are bound to defend it. The choice lies between living under coercion and intimidation, the forces of evil, or under the laws of the people, orderly, speaking with their settled convictions, the revelation of a divine authority. End of chapter 39 Recording by David Martin Jane Austen by Anne Thackeray Ritchie This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jane Austen, 1775 to 1817 A mesure qu'on a plus d'esprit, on trouve qu'il y a plus des hommes originaux. Les gens du commune ne trouvaient pas la différence entre des hommes. Pascal Part 1 I did not know that you were a studier of character, says Bingley to Elizabeth. It must be an amusing study. Yes, but intricate characters are the most amusing. They have at least that advantage. The country, said Darcy, can in general supply but few subjects for such a study. In a country neighbourhood you move in a very confined and unvarying society. But people themselves alter so much, Elizabeth answers, that there is something new to be observed in them for ever. Yes, indeed, cried Mrs. Bennet, offended by Darcy's manner of mentioning a country neighbourhood. I assure you that we have quite as much of that going on in the country as in town. Everybody was surprised, and Darcy, after looking at her for a moment, turned silently away. Mrs. Bennet, who fancied she had gained a complete victory over him, continued her triumph. These people belong to a whole world of familiar acquaintances, who are, notwithstanding their old-fashioned dresses and quaint expressions, more alive to us than a great many of the people among whom we live. We know so much more about them to begin with. Notwithstanding a certain reticence and self-control which seems to belong to their age, and with all their quaint dresses and ceremonies and manners, the ladies and gentlemen in Pride and Prejudice and its companion novels seem like living people out of our own acquaintance, transported bodily into a bygone age, represented in the half-dozen books that contain Jane Austen's works. Dear Books bright sparkling with wit and animation in which the homely heroines charm the dull hours fly and the very bores are enchanting could we but study our own bores as miss austen must have studied hers in her country village what a delightful world this might be a world of norris's economical great walkers with dining-room tables to dispose of of lady bertram's on sofas with their placid do not act anything improper my dears sir thomas would not like it of bennett's goddard's bates's of mr collins's of rushbrook's with two and forty speeches apiece a world of mrs elton's inimitable woman she must be alive at this very moment if we but knew where to find her her basket on her arm, her nods and all importance, with Maple Grove and the sucklings in the background. 
she would be much excited were she aware how she is esteemed by a late chancellor of the exchequer who is well acquainted with maple grove and selina too it might console her for mr knightley's shabby marriage all these people nearly start out of the pages so natural and unaffected are they and yet they never lived except in the imagination of one lady with bright eyes who sat down some seventy years ago to an old mahogany desk in a quiet country parlour and evoked them for us one seems to see the picture of the unknown friend who has charmed us so long charmed away dull hours created neighbours and companions for us in lonely places conferring happiness and harmless mirth upon generations to come one can picture her as she sits erect with her long and graceful figure her full round face her bright eyes cast down jane austen the woman of whom england is justly proud whose method generous macaulay has placed near shakespeare she is writing in secret putting away her work when visitors come in unconscious modest hidden at home in heart as she was in her sweet and womanly life with the wisdom of the serpent indeed and the harmlessness of a dove some one said just now that many people seem to be so proud of seeing a joke at all that they impress it upon you until you are perfectly wearied by it jane austen was not of these her humour flows gentle and spontaneous it is no elaborate mechanism nor artificial fountain but a bright natural stream rippling and trickling over every stone and sparkling in the sunshine we should be surprised nowadays to hear a young lady announce herself as a studier of character from her quiet home in the country lane this one reads to us a real page from the absorbing pathetic humorous book of human nature a book that we can most of us understand when it is translated into plain english but of which the quaint and illegible characters are often difficult to decipher for ourselves it is a study which with all respect for darcy's opinion must require something of country-like calm and concentration and freedom of mind it is difficult for instance for a too impulsive student not to attribute something of his own moods to his specimens instead of dispassionately contemplating them from a critical distance besides the natural fun and wit and life of her characters all perfectly discriminated as macaulay says jane austen has the gift of telling a story in a way that has never been surpassed she rules her places times characters and marshals them with unerring precision in her special gift for organization she seems almost unequalled her picnics are models for all future and past picnics her combinations of feelings of conversation of gentlemen and ladies are so natural and lifelike that reading to criticize is impossible to some of us the scene carries us away and we forget to look for the art by which it is recorded her machinery is simple but complete events group themselves so vividly and naturally in her mind that in describing imaginary scenes we seem not only to read them but to live them to see the people coming and going the gentlemen courteous and in top boots the ladies demure and piquant we can almost hear them talking to one another no retrospects no abrupt flights as in real life days and events follow one another last tuesday does not suddenly start into existence all out of place nor does 1790 appear on the scene when we are all well on in 21 countries and continents do not fly from hero to hero nor do long and divergent adventures happen to unimportant members of the company with jane austen days hours minutes succeed each other like clockwork one central figure is always present on the scene that figure is always prepared for company miss edwards's curl papers are almost the only approach to deshabille in her stories there are post chaises in readiness to convey the characters from bath or lyme to upper cross to fullerton from gracechurch street to meryton as their business takes them 
Mr. Knightley rides from Brunswick Square to Hartfield, by a road that Miss Austen herself must have travelled in the curricle with her brother, driving to London on a summer's day. It was a wet ride for Mr. Knightley, followed by that never-to-be-forgotten afternoon in the shrubbery, when the wind had changed into a softer quarter. The clouds were carried off, and Emma, walking in the sunshine, with spirits freshened and thoughts a little relieved, and thinking of Mr. Knightley as sixteen miles away, meets him at the garden door, and everybody, I think, must be the happier for the happiness and certainty that one half-hour gave to Emma and her indifferent lover. There is a little extract from one of Miss Austen's letters to a niece, which shows that all this successful organisation was not brought about by chance alone, but came from careful workmanship. Your Aunt C, she says, does not like desultory novels, and is rather fearful that yours will be too much so, that there will be too frequent a change from one set of people to another, and that circumstances will be sometimes introduced of apparent consequence, which will lead to nothing. It will not be so great an objection to me. I allow much more latitude than she does, and think nature and spirit cover many sins of a wandering story. But though the sins of a wandering story may be covered, the virtues of a well-told one make themselves felt unconsciously, and without any effort. Some books and people are delightful. We can scarce tell why. They are not so clever as others that weary and fatigue us. It is a certain effort to read a story, however touching, that is disconnected and badly related. It is like an ill-drawn picture of which the colouring is good. Jane Austen possesses both gifts of colour and of drawing. She could see human nature as it was, with near-sighted eyes, it is true, but having seen, she could combine her picture by her art and colour it from life. How delightful the people are who play at cards, and pay their addresses to one another, and sup and discuss each other's affairs take mr bennett's reception of his sons-in-law take sir walter elliot compassionating the navy and admiral baldwin nine grey hairs of a side and nothing but a dab of powder at top a wretched example of what a seafaring life can do for men who are exposed to every climate and weather until they are not fit to be seen it is a pity they are not knocked on the head at once before they reach admiral baldwin's age or shall we quote the scene of fanny price's return when she comes to visit her family at portsmouth in all daughterly agitation and excitement and the brothers and fathers and sisters reception of her a stare or two at fanny was all the voluntary notice that her brother bestowed but he made no objection to her kissing him though still entirely engaged in detailing further particulars of the thrushes going out of harbour in which he had a strong right of interest being about to commence his career of seamanship in her at this very time after the mother and daughter have received her fanny's seafaring father comes in and does not notice her at first in his excitement captain walsh thinks you will certainly have a cruise to the westward with the elephant by i wish you may but old scoley was saying just now that he thought you would be sent first to the texel well well we are ready whatever happens but by goodness you lost a fine sight by not being here in the morning to see the thrush go out of harbour i would not have been out of the way for a thousand pounds old scoley ran in at breakfast time to say she had slipped her moorings and was coming up I jumped up and made but two steps to the platform. If ever there was a perfect beauty afloat, she is one, and there she lies at Spithead, and anybody in England would take her for an eight-and-twenty. I was upon the platform for two hours this afternoon looking at her. She lies close to the Endymion, between her and the Cleopatra, just to the eastward of the sheer hulk. Ha! cried William that's just where i should have put her myself it's the best berth in spithead but here is my sister sir here is fanny turning and leading her forward it is so dark you do not see her 
with an acknowledgment that he had quite forgot her mr price now received his daughter and having given her a cordial hug and observed that she was growing into a woman and he supposed would be wanting a husband soon seemed very much inclined to forget her again how admirably it is all told how we hear them all talking from her own brothers jane austen learned her accurate knowledge of ships and seafaring things from her own observation she must have gathered her delightful droll science of men and women and their ways and various destinations who will not recognize mrs norris in that master touch by which she removes the curtain to save sir thomas's feelings that curtain which had been prepared for the private theatricals he so greatly disapproved of mrs norris thoughtfully carries it off to her cottage where she happened to be particularly in want of green bays part two the charm of friends of pen and ink is their unchangeableness we go to them when we want them we know where to seek them we know what to expect from them they are never preoccupied they are always at home they never turn their backs nor walk away as people do in real life nor let their houses and leave the neighbourhood and disappear for weeks together they are never taken up with strange people nor suddenly absorbed into some more genteel society or by some nearer fancy even the most volatile among them is to be counted upon we may have neglected them and yet when we meet again there are the familiar old friends and we seem to find our own old selves again in their company for us time has perhaps passed away feelings have swept by leaving interests and recollections in their place but at all ages there must be days that belong to our youth hours that will recur so long as men forbear and women remember and life itself exists perhaps the most fashionable marriage on the tapis no longer excites us very much but the sentiment of an emma or an anne elliot comes home to some of us as vividly as ever it is something to have such old friends who are so young an emma blooming without a wrinkle or a grey hair after twenty years acquaintance and elizabeth bennet sprightly and charming ever in the roundabout papers there is a passage about the pen and ink friends my father loved they used to call the good sir walter the wizard of the north what if some writer should appear who can write so enchantingly that he shall be able to call into actual life the people whom he invents what if mignon and margaret and goethe von berlichingen are alive now though i don't say they are visible and dugald dalgetty and ivanhoe were to step in at that open window by the little garden yonder suppose uncas and our noble old leather stocking were to glide in silent suppose athos porthos and aramis should enter with a noiseless swagger curling their moustaches and dearest amelia booth on uncle toby's arm and tittlebat titmouse with his hair dyed green and all the crumbless company of comedians with the gil blast troupe and sir roger de coverley and the greatest of all crazy gentlemen the knight of la mancha with his blessed squire i say to you i look rather wistfully towards the window musing upon these people were any of them to enter i think i would not be very much frightened are not such friends as these and others unnamed here but who will come unannounced to join the goodly company creations that like some people do actually make part of our existence and make us the better for theirs to express some vague feelings is to stamp them have we any one of us a friend in a knight of la mancha a colonel newcombe a sir roger de coverley they live for us even though they may have never lived they are and do actually make part of our lives one of the best and noblest parts to love them is like a direct communication with the great and generous minds that conceived them it is difficult reading the novels of succeeding generations to determine how much each book reflects of the time in which it was written 
how much of its character depends upon the mind and the mood of the writer the greatest minds the most original have the least stamp of the age the most of that dominant natural reality which belongs to all great minds we know how a landscape changes as the day goes on and how the scene brightens and gains in beauty as the shadows begin to lengthen the clearest eyes must see by the light of their own hour jane austen's literary hour must have been a midday hour bright unsuggestive with objects standing clear without much shadow or elaborate artistic effect our own age is more essentially an age of strained emotion little remains to us of starch of powder or courtly reserve what we have lost in calm in happiness in tranquillity we have gained in emphasis our danger is now not of expressing and feeling too little but of expressing more than we feel the living writers of to-day lead us into distant realms and worlds undreamt of in the placid and easily contented jigo age our characters travel by rail and are no longer confined to post chaises there is certainly a wide difference between miss austen's heroines and let us say a maggie tulliver one would be curious to know whether between the human beings who read jane austen's books to-day and those who read them fifty years ago there is as great a contrast one reason may be perhaps that characters in novels are certainly more intimate with us and on less ceremonious terms than in jane austen's days when heroines never gave up a certain gentle self-respect and humour and hardness of heart in which some modern types are a little wanting whatever happens they could for the most part speak of quietly and without bitterness love with them does not mean a passion so much as an interest deep silent not quite incompatible with a secondary flirtation marian dashwood's tears are evidently meant to be dried jane bennett smiles sighs and makes excuses for bingley's neglect emma passes one disagreeable morning making up her mind to the unnatural alliance between mr knightley and harriet smith it was the spirit of the age and perhaps one not to be unenvied it was not that jane austen herself was incapable of understanding a deeper feeling in the last written page of her last written book there is an expression of the deepest and truest experience annie elliot's talk with captain benfield is the touching utterance of a good woman's feelings they are speaking of men and of women's affections you're always labouring and toiling she says exposed to every risk and hardship your home country friends all united neither time nor life to be called your own it would be too hard indeed with a faltering voice if a woman's feelings were to be added to all this further on she says eagerly i hope i do justice to all that is felt by you and by those who resemble you god forbid that i should undervalue the warm and faithful feelings of any of my fellow-creatures i should deserve utter contempt if i dared to suppose that true attachment and constancy were known only by woman no i believe you capable of everything good and great in your married lives i believe you equal to every important exertion and to every domestic forbearance so long as if i may be allowed the expression so long as you have an object i mean while the woman you love lives and lives for you all the privilege i claim for my own sex it is not a very enviable one you need not court it is that of loving longest when existence or when hope is gone she could not immediately have uttered another sentence her heart was too full her breath too much oppressed dear anne elliot sweet impulsive womanly tender-hearted one can almost hear her voice pleading the cause of all true women 
in those days when perhaps people's nerves were stronger than they are now sentiment may have existed in a less degree or have been more ruled by judgment it may have been calmer and more matter-of-fact and yet jane austen at the very end of her life wrote thus her words seem to ring in our ears after they have been spoken anne elliot must have been jane austen herself speaking for the last time there is something so true so womanly about her that it is impossible not to love her most of all she is the bright-eyed heroine of the earlier novels matured softened cultivated to whom fidelity has brought only greater depth and sweetness instead of bitterness and pain what a difficult thing it would be to sit down and try to enumerate the different influences by which our lives have been affected influences of other lives of art of nature of place and circumstance of beautiful sights passing before our eyes of painful ones seasons following in their course hills rising on our horizons scenes of ruin and desolation crowded thoroughfares sounds in our ears jarring or harmonious the voices of friends calling warning encouraging of preachers preaching of people in the street below complaining and asking our pity what long processions of human beings are passing before us what trains of thought go sweeping through our brains man seems a strange and ill-kept record of many and bewildering experiences look at oneself not as oneself but as an abstract human being one is lost in wonder at the vast complexities which have been brought to bear upon it lost in wonder and in disappointment perhaps at the discordant result of so great a harmony only we know that the whole diapason is beyond our grasp one man cannot hear the note of the grasshoppers another is deaf when the cannon sounds waiting among these many echoes and mysteries of every kind and light and darkness and life and death we seize a note or two of the great symphony and try to sing and because these notes happen to jar we think all is discordant hopelessness then comes pressing onward in the crowd of life voices with some of the notes that are wanting to our own part voices tuned to the same key as our own or to an accordant one making harmony for us as they pass us by perhaps this is in life the happiest of all experience and to few of us there exists any more complete ideal and so now and then in our lives when we learn to love a sweet and noble character we all feel happier and better for the goodness and charity which is not ours and yet which seems to belong to us while we are near it just as some people and states of mind affect us uncomfortably so we seem to be true to ourselves with a truthful person generous-minded with a generous nature life seems less disappointing and self-seeking when we think of the just and sweet and unselfish spirits moving untroubled among dinning and distracting influences these are our friends in the best and noblest sense we are the happier for their existence it is so much gain to us they may have lived at some distant time we may never have met face to face or we may have known them and been blessed by their love but their light shines from afar their life is for us and with us in its generous example their song is for our ears and we hear it and love it still though the singer may be lying dead part three a little book written by one of jane austen's nephews tells with a touching directness and simplicity the story of this good and gifted woman whose name has long been a household word among us but of whose history nothing was known until this little volume appeared it is but the story of a country lady of quiet days following quiet days of seasons in their course of common events and yet the history is deeply interesting to those who loved the writer of whom it is written 
and as we turn from the story of jane austen's life to her books again we feel more than ever that she too was one of those true friends who belong to us inalienably simple wise contented living in others one of those whom we seem to have a right to love such people belong to all humankind by the very right of their wide and generous sympathies of their gentle wisdom and lovableness jane austen's life as it is told by mr austen lee is very touching sweet and peaceful it is a country landscape where the cattle are grazing the boughs of the great elm tree rocking in the wind sometimes as we read they come falling with a crash into the sweep birds are flying about the old house homely in its simple rule the rafters cross the whitewashed ceilings the beams project into the room below we can see it all the parlour with the horsehair sofa the scant quaint furniture the old-fashioned garden outside with its flowers and vegetables combined and along the south side of the garden the green terrace sloping away there is a pretty description of the sisters devotion to one another when cassandra went to school little jane accompanied her the sisters could not be parted of the family party of the old place where there are hedgerows winding with green shady footpaths within the copse where the earliest primroses and hyacinths are found there is the woodwalk with its rustic seats leading to the meadows the church walk leading to the church which is far from the hum of the village and within sight of no habitation except a glimpse of the grey manor house through its circling screen of sycamores sweet violets both purple and white grow in abundance beneath its south wall large elms protrude their rough branches old hawthorns shed their blossoms over the graves and the hollow yew tree must be at least coeval with the church one may read the account of catherine morland's home with new interest from the hint which is given of its likeness to the old house at steventon where dwelt the unknown friend whose voice we seem to hear at last and whose face we seem to recognize her bright eyes and brown curly hair her quick and graceful figure one can picture the children who are playing at the door of the old parsonage and calling for aunt jane one can imagine her pretty ways with them her sympathy for the active their games and imaginations there is cassandra she is older than her sister more critical more beautiful more reserved there is the mother of the family with her keen wit and clear mind the handsome father the handsome proctor as he was called the five brothers driving up the lane tranquil summer passes by the winter days go by the young lady still sits writing at the old mahogany desk and smiling perhaps at her own fancies and hiding them away with her papers at the sound of coming steps now the modest papers printed and reprinted lie in every hand the fancies disport themselves at their will in the wisest brains and the most foolish it must have been at steventon jane austen's earliest home that mr collins first made his appearance lady catherine not objecting as we know to his occasional absence on a sunday provided another clergyman was engaged to do the duty of the day and here conversing with miss jane that he must have made many of his profoundest observations upon human nature remarking among other things that resignation is never so perfect as when the blessing denied begins to lose somewhat of its value in our estimation and propounding his celebrated theory about the usual practice of elegant females it must have been here too that poor mrs bennet declared with some justice that once estates are entailed one can never tell how they will go here too that mrs allen's sprigged muslin and john thorpe's rhodomontades were woven that his gig was built curricle hung lamps seat trunk sword-case splashboard silver moulding all you see complete the ironwork as good as new or better he asked fifty guineas i closed with him directly threw down the money 
and the carriage was mine and i am sure said catherine i know so little of such things that i cannot judge whether it was cheap or dear neither the one nor the other says john thorpe mrs palmer was also born at steventon that good-humoured lady in sense and sensibility who thinks it so ridiculous that her husband never hears her when she speaks to him we are told that marianne and eleanor have been supposed to represent cassandra and jane austen but mr austen lee says that he can trace no resemblance jane austen is not twenty when this book is written and only twenty-one when pride and prejudice is first devised cousins presently come on the scene and amongst them the romantic figure of a young widowed comtesse de feuillade flying from the revolution to her uncle's home she is described as a clever and accomplished woman interested in her young cousins teaching them french both jane and cassandra knew french helping in their various schemes in their theatricals in the barn she eventually marries her cousin henry austen the simple family annals are not without their romance but there is a cruel one for poor cassandra whose lover dies abroad and his death saddens the whole family party jane too receives the addresses do such things as addresses exist nowadays of a gentleman possessed of good character and fortune and of everything in short except the subtle power of touching her heart one cannot help wondering whether this was a henry crawford or an elton or a mr elliot or had jane already seen the person that even cassandra thought good enough for her sister here too is another sorrowful story the sister's fate there is a sad coincidence and similarity in it was to be undivided their life their experience was the same some one without a name takes leave of jane one day promising to come back he never comes back long afterwards they hear of his death the story seems even sadder than cassandra's in its silence and uncertainty for silence and uncertainty are death in life to some people there is little trace of such a tragedy in jane austen's books not one morbid word is to be found not one vain regret hers was not a nature to fall crushed by the overthrow of one phase of her manifold life she seems to have had a natural genius for life if i may so speak too vivid and genuinely unselfish to fail her in her need she could gather every flower every brightness along her road good spirit content all the interests of a happy and observant nature were hers her gentle humour and wit and interest cannot have failed it is impossible to calculate the difference of the grasp by which one or another human being realises existence and the things relating to it nor how much more vivid life seems to some than to others jane austen while her existence lasted realised it and made the best use of the gifts that were hers yet when her life was ending then it was given to her to understand the change that was at hand as willingly as she had lived she died some people seem scarcely to rise up to their own work to their own ideal jane austen's life as it is told by her nephew is beyond her work which only contained one phase of that sweet and wise nature the creative observant outward phase for her home for her sister for her friends she kept the depth and tenderness of her bright and gentle sympathy she is described as busy with her neat and clever fingers sewing for the poor working fanciful keepsakes for her friends there is the cup and ball that she never failed to catch the spillikins lie in every ring where she had thrown them there are her letters straightly and neatly folded and fitting smoothly in their creases there is something sweet orderly and consistent in her character and all her tastes in her fondness for crab and cowper in her little joke that she ought to be a mrs crab she sings of an evening old ballad to old-fashioned tunes with a slow sweet voice 
further on we have a glimpse of jane and her sisters in their mob caps young still but dressed soberly beyond their years one can imagine aunt jane with her brother's children round her knee telling her delightful stories or listening to theirs with never failing sympathy one can fancy cassandra who does not like desultory novels more prudent and more reserved and somewhat less of a playfellow looking down upon the group with elder sister's eyes here is an extract from a letter written at steventon in eighteen hundred i have two messages let me get rid of them and then my paper will be my own mary fully intended writing by mr charles's frank and only happened entirely to forget it but will write soon and my father wishes edward to send him a memorandum of the price of hops sunday evening we have had a dreadful storm of wind in the forepart of the day which has done a great deal of mischief among our trees i was sitting alone in the drawing-room when an odd kind of crash startled me in a moment afterwards it was repeated i then went to the window i reached it just in time to see the last of our two highly valued elms descend into the sweep the other which had fallen i suppose in the first crash and which was nearest to the pond taking a more easterly direction sank among our screen of chestnuts and firs knocking down one spruce fir breaking off the head of another and stripping the two corner chestnuts of several branches in its fall this is not all the maple bearing the weathercock was broken in two and what i regret more than all the rest is that all the three elms that grew in hall's meadow and gave such ornament to it are gone a certain mrs stent comes into one of these letters ejaculating some wonder about the cocks and hens mrs stent seems to have tried their patience and will be known henceforward as having bored jane austen they leave steventon when jane is about twenty-five years of age and go to bath from whence a couple of pleasant letters are given us jane is writing to her sister she has visited miss a who like all other young ladies is considerably genteeler than her parents she is heartily glad that cassandra speaks so comfortably of her health and looks could travelling fifty miles produce such an immediate change you were looking poorly when you were here and everybody seemed sensible of it is there any charm in a hack post chaise but if there were mrs craven's carriage might have undone it all then mrs stent appears again poor mrs stent it has been her lot to be always in the way but we must be merciful for perhaps in time we may come to be mrs stents ourselves unequal to anything and unwelcome to everybody elsewhere she writes upon mrs somebody's mentioning that she had sent the rejected addresses to mr h i began talking to her a little about them and expressed my hope of their having amused her her answer was oh dear yes very much very droll indeed the opening of the house and the striking up of the fiddles what she meant poor woman who shall say but there is no malice in jane austen hers is the charity of all clear minds it is only the muddled who are intolerant all who love emma and mr knightley must remember the touching little scene in which he reproves her for her thoughtless impatience of poor miss bates's volubility you whom she had known from an infant whom she had seen grow up from a period when her notice was an honour to have you now in thoughtless spirits and in pride of the moment laugh at her humble her this is not pleasant to you emma and it is very far from pleasant to me but i must i will i will tell you truths while i am satisfied with proving myself your friend by very faithful counsel and trusting that you will some time or other do me greater justice than you can do me now while they talked they were advancing towards the carriage it was ready and before she could speak again he had handed her in he had misinterpreted the feeling which kept her face averted and her tongue motionless mr knightley's little sermon 
in its old-fashioned english is as applicable now as it was when it was spoken we know that he was an especial favourite with jane austen part four mr austen died at bath and his family removed to southampton in eighteen eleven mrs austen her daughters and her niece settled finally at chawton a house belonging to jane's brother mr knight he was adopted by an uncle whose name he took and from chawton all her literary work was given to the world sense and sensibility pride and prejudice were already written but in the next five years from thirty-five to forty she set to work seriously and wrote mansfield park emma and persuasion any one who has written a book will know what an amount of labour this represents one can picture to oneself the little family scene which jane describes to cassandra pride and prejudice just come down in a parcel from town the unsuspicious miss b to dinner and jane and her mother setting to in the evening and reading aloud half the first volume of a new novel sent down by the brother unsuspicious miss b is delighted jane complains of her mother's too rapid way of getting on though she perfectly understands the characters herself she cannot speak as they ought upon the whole however she says i am quite vain enough and well satisfied enough this is her own criticism of pride and prejudice the work is rather too light and bright and sparkling it wants shade it wants to be stretched out here and there with a long chapter of sense if it could be had if not of solemn specious nonsense about something unconnected with the story an essay on writing a critique on walter scott or the history of bonaparte and so jane austen lives quietly working at her labour of love interested in her own darling children's success the light of the home one of the real living children says afterwards speaking in the days when she was no longer there she goes to london once or twice once she lives for some months in hans place nursing a brother through an illness here it was that she received some little compliments and messages from the prince regent to whom she dedicated emma he thanks her and acknowledges the handsome volumes and she laughs and tells her publisher that at all events his share of the offering is appreciated whatever hers may be we are also favoured with some valuable suggestions from mr clark the royal librarian respecting a very remarkable clergyman he is anxious that miss austen should delineate one who should pass his time between the metropolis and the country something like beatty's minstrel entirely engaged in literature and no man's enemy but his own failing to impress this character upon the authoress he makes a fresh suggestion and proposes that she should write a romance illustrative of the august house of coburg it would be interesting he says and very properly dedicated to prince leopold to which the authoress replies i could no more write a romance than an epic poem i could not seriously sit down to write a romance under any other motive than to save my life and if it were indispensable for me to keep it up and never relax into laughing at myself or other people i am sure i should be hung before the first chapter there is a delightful collection of friends suggestions which she has put together but which is too long to be quoted here she calls it plan of a novel as suggested by various friends all this time while her fame is slowly growing life passes in the same way as in the old cottage at chawton aunt jane with her young face and her mob cap makes playhouses for the children helps them to dress up invents imaginary conversations for them supposing that they are all grown up the day after a ball one can imagine how delightful a game that must have seemed to the little girls she built her nest did this good woman happily weaving it out of shreds and ends and scraps of daily duty patiently put together and it was from this nest that she sang the song bright and brilliant with quaint thrills and unexpected cadences that reaches us even here through near a century the lesson her life seems to teach us is this 
don't let us despise our nests life is as much made of minutes as of years let us complete the daily duties let us patiently gather the twigs and the little scraps of moss of dried grass together and see the result a whole completed and coherent beautiful even without the song we come too soon to the story of her death and yet did it come too soon a sweet life is not the sweeter for being long jane austen lived years enough to fulfil her mission she lived long enough to write six books that were masterpieces in their way to make a world the happier for her industry one cannot read the story of her latter days of her patience her sweetness and gratitude without emotion there is family trouble we are not told of what nature she falls ill her nieces find her in her dressing-gown like an invalid in an armchair in her bedroom but she gets up and greets them and pointing to seats which had been arranged for them by the fire says there is a chair for the married lady and a little stool for you caroline but she is too weak to talk and cassandra takes them away at last they persuade her to go to winchester to a well-known doctor there it distressed me she says in one of her last dying letters to see uncle henry and william knight who kindly attended us riding in the rain almost the whole way we expect a visit from them to-morrow and hope they will stay the night and on thursday which is a confirmation and a holiday we hope to get charles out to breakfast we have had but one visit from him poor fellow as he is in the sick room god bless you dear e if ever you are ill may you be as tenderly nursed as i have been but nursing does not cure her nor can the doctor save her to them all and she sinks from day to day to the end she is full of concern for others as for my dearest sister my tender watchful indefatigable nurse has not been made ill by her exertions she writes as to what i owe her and the anxious affection of all my beloved family on this occasion i can only cry over it and pray god to bless them more and more one can hardly read this last sentence with dry eyes it is her parting blessing and farewell to those she had blessed all her life by her presence and her love that love which is beyond death and of which the benediction remains not only spoken in words but by the ever-present signs and the tokens of those lifetimes which do not end for us as long as we ourselves exist they asked her when she was near her end if there was anything she wanted nothing but death she said those were her last words she died on the eighteenth of july eighteen seventeen and was buried in winchester cathedral where she lies not unremembered end of jane austen by anne thackeray ritchie read by noel badrian Japanese Swords by Anonymous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Japanese Swords. Amongst the numberless articles of Japanese attire, works of art or mere household objects which the restoration of 1868 compelled the Japanese to cast upon the market, none has met with such wide fame and yet with such a limited study as the sword. When, in 1877, the government prohibited the samurai from wearing any longer the two swords which had been the privilege and distinctive mark of their martial caste, the imperial wish was obeyed, notwithstanding the feeling that something was snapping in the life of the nation. Blades had been treasured for centuries, handed from father to son, looked upon as the soul of the owner for the sake of which he would refrain from any deed unbecoming a gentleman. 
some possessed histories going far back into the eleventh and twelfth centuries when the country was at war within itself around others were entwined romances and above all the sword was the faithful friend with which the samurai might honourably end his life either in the field or on the mats a blade given by a father to his daughter on her wedding day was the emblem of that purity of life which the woman was expected to keep and it was also the weapon with which she might seek repose in death should occasion arise the restoration breaking up the old feudal system compelled the samurai to part with their worldly goods to secure the necessities of life the rich became poor the poor lost all support hence anything which might tempt the foreign buyer went swiftly out of the country the circumstances had become rather more straitened for the samurai class when the edict of eighteen seventy seven compelled them to put aside their swords and blades followed the lacquer the paintings the carvings which eager curio buyers snapped at inadequate prices many swords of first quality crossed the waters besides thousands of poor blades which could be bought in dozens in the stores and bazaars of the old world hardly any attempt was made at keeping in the country any blades except those which were so to speak entailed heirlooms or those whose owners refused to part with at any price later a few earnest people banded themselves into a society for the preservation and study of the national weapon the sword society of tokyo which has published during the last twelve years a mass of information about swords collecting swords has become a national propensity and the modern sword lover may have more blades carefully kept and oft admired than his ancestor of a century ago who could only wear two at a time magazines have sprung into existence dealing only with the sword and its accessories both in europe and in america articles on the sword have been published most of which based upon the paper of hutterot and nearly all inadequate it is to be hoped that some more comprehensive work will soon appear to give the western public a better knowledge of the ancient swords in japan there are hundreds of books dealing with their makers from ancient books now rare and costly to modern works crammed with information and obtainable for a few pence what then is there about the japanese blade which compels admiration far back in the sung dynasty a chinese poet sang its praises later the medieval european writers spoke in wonderment of the katana of its keenness of edge of its swift stroke of the respect paid to it later still folks were awed by the form of suicide we call seppuku some saw in it only a barbarous disembowelment few perhaps grasped that other important feature the test of the truest friendship that confidence in the bosom friend one entrusted with the cutting of one's head romance alone would not have made the blade an object of interest to the positive mind attracted by the efficiency of the weapon by its qualities qua sword by the marvellous skill evinced in its forging in the shaping of its harmonious curves further the blade presented a characteristic temper unlike the european swords evenly tempered throughout it had a mere edge of great hardness backed by enough softer metal to ensure toughness and to allow bending in preference to snapping when the sword blow met an unexpected resistance then it was realized that all those characteristic peculiarities required study for they presented variations of appearance intimately associated with the various swordsmiths with the periods the schools how numerous those smiths were may be guessed but it may come as a surprise to some that over eleven thousand names are recorded in one book alone to study a blade and appreciate its points is a matter of considerable interest the various portions of the blade have their names and their peculiarities 
one must pay attention to every part of the body of its edge of the handle etc and with practice an expert may become able to recognize the technique and style of a smith by the peculiarities of the blade silent witnesses left in the metal itself thus in japan the honami family of sword experts were professionally engaged for over three hundred fifty years in examining and certifying blades in feudal days a man's life was at his lord's call and he might never feel sure that the following day would not be his last either in fight or by self-infliction under orders of the death penalty for some breach however slight of the stiff code of samurai etiquette hence his sword was selected and cared for its edge must be keen enough to cut a man's head at a blow leaving if skilfully done a shred of skin on the throat for the head to hang on the breast his sword was tested sometimes officially by cutting up corpses and thus we come across blades on the tang of which is inscribed a statement that it cut one or two or even three bodies at a blow no sword in europe ever came through such an ordeal indeed it is doubtful whether its shape and constitution would have allowed a similar test to be successful looked upon as a cutting weapon the japanese blade has been pronounced perfect by all experts that perfection is the result of thorough work undertaken with only one aim in view to turn out a sword which was not only reliable but a credit to the maker as well and indeed the names of the smiths are as well known as those of the foremost painters they rank with the expert calligraphers with the poets with the writers and the statesmen with those who made history masamune muramasa are names which have found their way even amongst the novels of the west not a dozen names of japanese sculptures can be mentioned although their works are to be found in any and every temple but eleven thousand names of swordsmiths remain where the carver could repair a faulty chisel stroke the smith has no such resource a slight flaw in welding his metal a little dirt remaining between two layers of steel and where in a smithy can one exclude dirt over haste in heating the metal resulting in a wrong temper or in spots on the blade and lo a fortnight's patient work was wasted a pattern offended a reputation marred no less important than the smith's skill was that of the polisher grinding away the blade to its final shape settling the planes and the curves whose intersections are geometrically true on every side of the blade a volume rather than a preface is required to do the scantiest justice to the japanese blade but space is limited and the blades exhibited here speak for themselves end of japanese swords by anonymous read by avai in january 2013music loving bears by joaquin miller this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reading by matt perard music loving bears by joaquin miller no don't despise the bear either in his life or his death he is a kingly fellow every inch a king a curious monkish music-loving roving robin hood of his sombre woods a silent monk who knows a great deal more than he tells and please don't go to look at him and sit in judgment on him behind the bars put yourself in his place and see how much of manhood or kinghood would be left in you with a muzzle on your mouth and only enough liberty left to push your nose between two rusty bars and catch the peanut which the good little boy has found to be a bad one and so generously tosses it to the bear of course the little boy remembering the experience of about forty other little boys in connection with the late bald-headed elijah has a prejudice against the bear family 
but why the full-grown man should so continually persist in caging this shaggy-coated dignified kingly and ancient brother of his i cannot see unless it is that he knows almost nothing at all of his better nature his shy innocent love of a joke his partiality for music and his imperial disdain of death and so with a desire that man may know a little more about this storied and classic creature which with noiseless and stately tread has come down to us out of the past and is as quietly passing away from the face of the earth these fragmentary facts are set down but first as to his love of music a bear loves music better than he loves honey and that is saying that he loves music better than he loves his life we were going to mill father and i and light howard in oregon about forty years ago with ox teams a dozen or two bags of wheat threshed with a flail and winnowed with a wagon cover and were camped for the night by the calapulo river for it took two days to reach the mill light got out his fiddle keeping his gun of course close at hand pretty soon the oxen came down came very close so close that they almost put their cold moist noses against the backs of our necks as we sat there on the ox yokes or reclined in our blankets around the crackling pine log fire and listened to the wild sweet strains that swept up and down and up till the very treetops seemed to dance and quiver with delight then suddenly father seemed to feel the presence of something or somebody strange and i felt it too but the fiddler felt heard saw nothing but the divine wild melody that made the very pine trees dance and quiver to their tips oh for the pure wild sweet plaintive music once more the music of monkey musk zip coon old dan tucker and all the other dear old airs that once made a thousand happy feet keep time on the puncheon floors from hudson's bank to the oregon but they are no more now they have passed away forever with the indian the pioneer and the music-loving bear it is strange how a man i mean the natural man will feel a presence long before he hears it or sees it you can always feel the approach of a but i forget you are of another generation a generation that only reads takes thought at second hand only if at all and you would not understand so let us get forward and not waste time in explaining the unexplainable to you father got up turned about put me behind him like as an animal will its young and peered back and down through the dense tangle of the deep river bank between two of the huge oxen which had crossed the plains with us to the water's edge then he reached around and drew me to him with his left hand pointing between the oxen sharp down the bank with his right forefinger a bear two bears and another coming one already more than half way across on the great mossy log that lay above the deep sweeping waters of the calapula and light kept on and the wild sweet music leapt up and swept through the delighted and dancing boughs above then father reached back to the fire and thrust a long burning bough deeper into the dying embers and the glittering sparks leapt and laughed and danced and swept out and up and up as if to companion with the stars then light knew he did not hear he did not see he only felt but the fiddle forsook his fingers and his chin in a second and his gun was to his face with the muzzle thrust down between the oxen and then my father's gentle hand reached out lay on that long black kentucky rifle barrel and it dropped down slept once more at the fiddler's side and again the melodies and the very stars came down believe me to listen for they never seemed so big and so close by before the bears 
sat down on their haunches at last, and one of them kept opening his mouth and putting out his red tongue, as if he really wanted to taste the music. Every now and then one of them would lift up a paw and gently tap the ground, as if to keep time with the music. And both my papa and Light said next day that those bears really wanted to dance. And that is all there is to say about that except that my father was the gentlest gentleman I ever knew, and his influence must have been boundless, for whoever before heard of any hunter laying down his rifle with a family of fat black bears holding the little snow-white cross on their breasts, almost within reach of its muzzle? The moon came up by and by, and the chin of the weary fiddler sank lower and lower till all was still, the oxen lay down and ruminated, with their noses nearly against us. Then the coal-black bears melted away before the milk-white moon, and we slept there, with the sweet breath of the cattle, like incense, upon us. But how does a bear die? Ah, I had forgotten. I must tell you of death, then. Well, we have different kinds of bears. I know little of the polar bear, and so say nothing positively of him. I am told, however, that there is not, considering his size, much snap or grit about him. But as for the others, I am free to say that they live and die like gentlemen. I shall find time, as we go forward, to set down many incidents out of my own experience to prove that the bear is often a humorist, and never by any means a bad fellow. Judge Hyten, odd as it may seem, has left the San Francisco bar for the bar of Mount Shasta every season for more than a quarter of a century, and he probably knows more about bears than any other eminently learned man in the world, and Henry Hyten will tell you that the bear is a good fellow at home, good all through, a brave, modest, sober old monk, a monkish Robin Hood in his good green wood. End of Music Loving Bears by Joaquin Miller The Paraplus of Hanno, Translator Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Arnie Horton The Voyage of Hanno Commander of the Carthaginians Found the parts of Libya beyond the Pillars of Hercules Which he deposited in the Temple of Saturn Excerpted from Historical Researches Into the Politics, Intercourse, and Trade Of the Carthaginians, Ethiopians, and Egyptians Written by A. H. L. Hearing And translated anonymously it was decreed by the Carthaginians that Hanno should undertake a voyage beyond the Pillars of Hercules, and found Libby Phoenician cities. He sailed accordingly with sixty ships of fifty oars each, and a body of men and women to the number of thirty thousand, and provisions and other necessaries. When we had passed the Pillars on our voyage, and had sailed beyond them for two days, we founded the first city, which we named Thymiaterium. Below it lay an extensive plain. Proceeding thence towards the west, we came to Soleis, a promontory of Libya, a place thickly covered with trees, where we erected a temple to Neptune, and again proceeded for the space of half a day towards the east, until we arrived at a lake, lying not far from the sea, and filled with abundance of large reeds. Here elephants and a great number of other wild beasts were feeding. Having passed the lake about a day's sail, we founded cities near the sea, called Caricontikos, and Gait, and Acre, and Melita, and Arambis. Thence we came to the great river Lyxus, which flows from Libya. On its banks the Lyxitae, a shepherd tribe, were feeding flocks, amongst whom we continued some time on friendly terms. Beyond the Lyxitae dwelt the inhospitable Ethiopians, 
who pasture a wild country intersected by large mountains from which they say the river lixus flows in the neighborhood of the mountains lived the troglodytae men of various appearances whom the lixitae described as swifter in running than horses having procured interpreters from them we coasted along a desert country towards the south two days thence we proceeded towards the east the course of a day here we found in a recess of a certain bay a small island containing a circle of five stadia where we settled a colony and called it cern we judged from our voyage that this place lay in a direct line with carthage for the length of our voyage from carthage to the pillars was equal to that from the pillars to cern we then came to a lake which we reacted by sailing up a large river called Cretis. this lake had three islands larger than cern from which proceeding a day's sail we came to the extremity of the lake that was overhung by large mountains inhabited by savage men clothed in skins of wild beasts who drove us away by throwing stones and hindering us from landing sailing thence we came to another river that was large and broad and full of crocodiles and river horses whence returning back we came again to cern thence we sailed towards the south twelve days coasting the shore the whole of which is inhabited by ethiopians who would not wait our approach but fled from us their language was not intelligible even to the lixitae who were with us towards the last day we approached some large mountains covered with trees the wood of which was sweet scented and variegated having sailed by these mountains for two days we came to an immense opening of the sea on each side of which towards the continent was a plain from which we saw night fire arising at intervals in all directions either more or less having taken in water there we sailed forwards five days near the land until we came to a large bay which our interpreters informed us was called the western horn in this was a large island and in the island a salt water lake and in this another island where when we had landed we could discover nothing in the daytime except trees but in the night we saw many fires burning and heard the sounds of pipes cymbals drums and confused shouts we were then afraid and our diviners ordered us to abandon the island sailing quickly away thence we passed a country burning with fires and perfumes and streams of fire supplied from it fell into the sea the country was impassable on account of the heat we sailed quickly thence being much terrified and passing on for four days we discovered at night a country full of fire in the middle was a lofty fire larger than the rest which seemed to touch the stars when day came we discovered it to be a large hill called the chariot of the gods on the third day after our departure thence having sailed by those streams of fire we arrived at a bay called the southern horn at the bottom of which lay an island like the former having a lake and in this lake another island full of savage people the greater part of whom were women whose bodies were hairy and whom our interpreters called gorillae though we pursued the men we could not seize any of them but all fled from us escaping over the precipices and defending themselves with stones three women were however taken but they attacked their conductors with their teeth and hands and could not be prevailed upon to accompany us having killed them we flayed them and brought their skins with us to carthage we did not sail farther on our provisions failing us end of the periplus of hanno by hanno the navigator the rhythm of education by alfred north whitehead this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Pedro Perez. The Rhythm of Education an address delivered to the Training College Association by Alfred North Whitehead.
By the rhythm of education I denote a certain principle which in its practical application is well known to everyone with educational experience. Accordingly, when I remember that I am speaking to an audience of some of the leading educationalists in England, I have no expectation that I shall be saying anything that is new to you. I do think, however, that the principle has not been subjected to an adequate discussion taking account of all the factors which should guide its application. I first seek for the boldest statement of what I mean by the rhythm of education, a statement so bold as to exhibit the point of this address in its utter obviousness. The principle is merely this, that different subjects and modes of study should be undertaken by pupils at fitting times when they have reached the proper stage of mental development. You will agree with me that this is a truism, never doubted and known to all. I am really anxious to emphasize the obvious character of the foundational idea of my address. For one reason, because this audience will certainly find it out for itself. But the other reason, the reason why I choose this subject for this course, is that I do not think that this obvious truth has been handled in educational practice with due attention to the psychology of the pupils. The tasks of infancy. I commence by challenging the adequacy of some principles by which the subjects for study are often classified in order. By this I mean that these principles can only be accepted as correct if they are so explained as to be explained away. Consider first the criterion of difficulty. It is not true that the easier subjects should precede the harder. On the contrary, some of the hardest must come first because nature so dictates and because they are essential to life. The first intellectual task which confronts an infant is the acquirement of spoken language. What an appalling task, the correlation of meanings with sounds. It requires an analysis of ideas and an analysis of sounds. We all know that the infant does it and that the miracle of his achievement is explicable. But so are all miracles, and yet to the wise they remain miracles. All I ask is that with this example staring us in the face, we should cease talking nonsense about postponing the harder subjects. What is the next subject in the education of the infant minds? The acquirement of written language. That is to say, the correlation of sounds with shapes. Great heavens, have our educationalists gone mad? They are setting babbling mites of six years old to tasks which might daunt a sage after lifelong toil. Again, the hardest task in mathematics is the study of the elements of algebra. And yet, this stage must precede the comparative simplicity of the differential calculus. I will not elaborate my point further. I merely restate it in the form that the postponement of difficulty is no safe clue for the maze of educational practice. The alternative principle of order among subjects is that of necessary antecedents, there we are obviously on firmer ground. It is impossible to read Hamlet until you can read, and the study of integers must precede the study of fractions. And yet even this firm principle dissolves under scrutiny. It is certainly true, but it is only true if you give an artificial limitation to the concept of a subject for study. The danger of the principle is that it is accepted in one sense for which it is almost a necessary truth and it is applied in another sense 
for which it is false. You cannot read Homer before you can read, but many a child, and in ages past many a man, has sailed with Odysseus over the seas of romance by the help of the spoken word of a mother or of some wandering bard. The uncritical application of the principle of the necessary antecedents of some subjects to other has, in the hands of dull people, with a turn for organization, produced in education the dryness of the Sahara. Stages of Mental Growth The reason for the title which I have chosen for this address, The Rhythm of Education, is derived from yet another criticism of current ideas. The pupil's progress is often conceived as a uniform steady advance undifferentiated by change of type or alteration in pace. For example, a boy may be conceived as starting Latin at 10 years of age and by a uniform progression steadily developing into a classical scholar at the age of 18 or 20. I hold that this conception of education is based upon a false psychology of the process of mental development which has gravely hindered the effectiveness of our methods. Life is essentially periodic. It comprises daily periods with their alterations of work and play, of activity and of sleep, and seasonal periods which dictate our terms and our holidays. And also it is composed of well-marked yearly periods. These are the gross obvious periods which no one can overlook. There are also subtler periods of mental growth with their cyclic recurrences, yet always different as we pass from cycle to cycle, though the subordinate stages are reproduced in each cycle. That is why I have chosen the term rhythmic as meaning essentially the conveyance of difference within a framework of repetition. Lack of attention to the rhythm and character of mental growth is a main source of wooden futility in education. I think that Hegel was right when he analyzed progress into three stages, which he called thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Though for the purpose of the application of his idea to educational theory, I do not think that the names he gave are very happily suggestive. In relation to intellectual progress, I would turn them the stage of romance, the stage of precision, and the stage of generalization. The stage of romance. The stage of romance is the stage of first apprehension. The subject matter has the vividness of novelty. It holds within itself unexplored connections with possibilities half disclosed by glimpses and half concealed by the wealth of material. In this stage, knowledge is not dominated by a systematic procedure. Such system as there must be is created piecemeal ad hoc. We are in the presence of immediate cognizance of facts, only intermittently subjecting fact to systematic dissection. Romantic emotion is essentially the excitement consequent on the transition from the bare facts to the first realizations of the import of their unexplored relationships. For example, Crusoe was a mere man, the sand was mere sand, the footprint was a mere footprint, and the island a mere island, and Europe was the busy world of men. But the sudden perception of the half-disclosed and half-hidden possibilities relating Crusoe and the sand and the footprint and the lonely island secluded from Europe constitutes romance. I have had to take an extreme case for illustration in order to make my meaning perfectly plain. But construed as an allegory 
representing the first stage in a cycle of progress. Education must essentially be a setting in order of a ferment already stirring in the mind. You cannot educate mind in vacuo. In our conception of education, we tend to confine it to the second stage of the cycle, namely to the stage of precision. But we cannot so limit our task without misconceiving the whole problem. We are concerned alike with the ferment, with the acquirement of precision, and with the subsequent fruition. The stage of precision. The stage of precision also represents an addition to knowledge. In this stage, width of relationship is subordinated to exactness of formulation. It is the stage of grammar, the grammar of language and the grammar of science. It proceeds by forcing on the student's acceptance a given way of analyzing the facts, bit by bit. New facts are added, but they are the facts which fit into the analysis. It is evident that a stage of precision is barren without a previous stage of romance, unless there are facts which have already been vaguely apprehended in their broad generality, the previous analysis is an analysis of nothing. It is simply a series of meaningless statements about bare facts, produced artificially and without any further relevance. I repeat that in this stage we do not merely remain within the circle of the facts elicited in the romantic epoch. The facts of romance have disclosed ideas with possibilities of wide significance and in the stage of precise progress we acquire other facts in a systematic order which thereby form both a disclosure and an analysis of the general subject matter of the romance. The stage of generalization. The final stage of generalization is Hegel's synthesis. It is a return to romanticism with added advantage of classified ideas and relevant technique. It is the fruition which has been the goal of the precise training. It is the final success. I am afraid that I have had to give a dry analysis of somewhat obvious ideas. It has been necessary to do so because my subsequent remarks presuppose that we have clearly in our minds the essential character of this threefold cycle. The cyclic processes. Education should consist in a continual repetition of such cycles. Each lesson, in its minor way, should form an eddy cycle, issuing in its own subordinate process. Longer periods should issue in definite attainments, which then form the starting grounds for fresh cycles. We should banish the idea of a mythical, far-off end of education, the pupils must be continually enjoying some fruition and starting afresh if the teacher is stimulating in exact proportion to his success in satisfying the rhythmic cravings of his pupils. An infant's first romance is its awakening to the apprehension of objects and to the appreciation of their connections. Its growth in mentality takes the exterior form of occupying itself in the coordination of its perceptions with its bodily activities. Its first stage of precision is mastering spoken language as an instrument for classifying its contemplation of objects and for strengthening its apprehension of emotional relations with other beings. Its first stage of generalization is the use of language for a classified and enlarged enjoyment of objects. This first cycle of intellectual progress 
from the achievement of perception to the acquirement of language and from the acquirement of language to classified thought and keener perception will bear more careful study it is the only cycle of progress which we can observe in its purely natural state the later cycles are necessarily tinged by the procedure of the current mode of education there is a characteristic of it which is often sadly lacking in subsequent education i mean that it achieves complete success at the end of it the child can speak its ideas are classified and its perceptions are sharpened the cycle achieves its object this is a great deal more than can be said for most systems of education as applied to most pupils but why should this be so certainly a newborn baby looks a most unpromising subject for intellectual progress when we remember the difficulty of the task before it i suppose it is because nature in the form of surrounding circumstances sets it a task for which the normal development of its brain is exactly fitted i do not think that there is any particular mystery about the fact of a child learning to speak and in consequence thinking all the better but it does offer food for reflection in the subsequent education we have not sought for cyclic processes which in a finite time run their course and within their own limited sphere achieve a complete success this completion is one outstanding character in the natural cycle of our infants later on we start a child on some subject say latin at the age of ten and hope by a uniform system of formal training to achieve success at the age of twenty the natural result is failure both in interest and in acquirement when i speak of failure i am comparing our results with the brilliant success of the first natural cycle i do not think that it is because our tasks are intrinsically too hard when i remember that the infant cycle is the hardest of all it is because our tasks are set in an unnatural way without rhythm and without the stimulus of intermediate successes and without concentration i have not yet spoken of this character of concentration which so conspicuously attaches to the infant's progress the whole being of the infant is absorbed in the practice of its cycle it has nothing else to divert its mental development in this respect there is a striking difference between this natural cycle and the subsequent history of the student's development it is perfectly obvious that life is very various and that the mind and brain naturally develop so as to adapt themselves to the many-hued world in which their lot is cast still after making allowance for this consideration we will be wise to preserve some measure of concentration for each of the subsequent cycles in particular we should avoid a competition of diverse subjects in the same stage of their cycles the fault of the older education was on rhythmic concentration on a single undifferentiated subject our modern system with its insistence on a preliminary general education and with its easy toleration of the analysis of knowledge into distinct subjects is an equally unrhythmic collection of distracting scraps i am pleading that we shall endeavor to weave in the learner's mind a harmony of patterns by coordinating the various elements of instruction into subordinate cycles each of intrinsic worth for the immediate apprehension of the pupil we must garner our crops 
each in its due season. The Romance of Adolescence We will now pass to some concrete applications of the ideas which have been developed in the former part of my address. The first cycle of infancy is succeeded by the cycle of adolescence, which opens with far the greatest stage of romance which we ever experienced. It is in this stage that the lines of characters are graven. How the child emerges from the romantic stage of adolescence is how the subsequent life will be molded by ideals and colored by imagination. It rapidly follows on the generalization of capacity produced by the acquirements of spoken language and of reading. The stage of generalization belonging to the infantile cycle is comparatively short because the romantic material of infancy is so scanty. The initial knowledge of the world in any developed sense of the word knowledge really commences after the achievement of the first cycle and thus issues in the tremendous age of romance. Ideas, facts, relationships, stories, histories, possibilities, artistry in words, in sounds, in form and in color crowd into the child's life, stir his feelings, excite his appreciation and incite his impulses to kindred activities. It is a saddening thought that on this golden age there falls so often the shadow of the grammar. I am thinking of a period of about four years in the child's life, roughly in ordinary cases, falling between the ages of eight and twelve or thirteen. It is the first great period of the utilization of the native language and of the developed powers of observation and of manipulation. The infant cannot manipulate, the child can. The infant cannot observe, the child can. The infant cannot retain thoughts by the recollection of words, the child can. The child thus enters upon a new world. Of course, the stage of precision prolongs itself as recurring in minor cycles, which form eddies in the great romance. The perfecting of writing, of spelling, of the elements of arithmetic, and of lists of simple facts, such as the kings of England, are all elements of precision very necessary both as training in concentration and as useful acquirements. However, these are essentially fragmentary in character, whereas the great romance is the flood which bears on the child towards the life of the spirit. The success of the Montessori system is due to its recognition of the dominance of romance at this period of growth. If this be the explanation, it also points to the limitations of the usefulness of that method. It is the system which in some measure is essential for every romantic stage. Its essence is browsing and the encouragement of vivid freshness. But it lacks the restraint which is necessary for the great stages of precision. The Mastery of Language Towards the end of the great romance, the cyclic course of growth is swinging the child ever towards an aptitude for exact knowledge. Language is now the natural subject matter for concentrated attack. It is the mode of expression with which he is thoroughly familiar. He is acquainted with stories, histories and poems illustrating the lives of other people and of other civilizations. Accordingly, from the age of eleven onwards, 
there is wanted a gradually increasing concentration towards precise knowledge of language. Finally, the three years from 12 to 15 should be dominated by a mass attack upon language, so planned that a definite result in itself worth having is thereby achieved. I should guess that within these limits of time, and given adequate concentration, we might ask that at the end of that period the children should have command of English, should be able to read fluently fairly simple French, and should have completed the elementary stage of Latin. I mean a precise knowledge of the more straightforward parts of Latin grammar, the knowledge of the construction of Latin sentences, and the reading of some parts of appropriate Latin authors, perhaps simplified and largely supplemented by the aid of the best literary translations, so that their reading of the original, plus translation, gives them a grip of the book as a literary whole. I conceive that such a measure of attainment in these three languages is well within the reach of the ordinary child, provided that he has not been distracted by the effort at precision in a multiplicity of other subjects. Also, some more gifted children could go farther. The Latin would come to them easily, so that it would be possible to start Greek before the end of the period, always provided that their bent is literary and that they mean later to pursue that study at least for some years. Other subjects will occupy a subordinate place in the timetable and will be undertaking in a different spirit. In the first place, it must be remembered that the semi-literary subjects, such as history, will largely have been provided in the study of the languages. It will be hardly possible to read some English, French and Latin literature without imparting some knowledge of European history. I do not mean that all special history teaching should be abandoned. I do, however, suggest that the subject should be exhibited in what I have termed the romantic spirit, and that the pupils should not be subjected to the test of precise recollection of details on any large systematic scale. At this period of growth, science should be in its stage of romance. The pupils should see for themselves and experiment for themselves with only fragmentary precision of thought. The essence of the importance of science, both for interest in theory or for technological purposes, lies in its application to concrete detail, and every such application evokes a novel problem for research. Accordingly, all training in science should begin as well as end in research, and in getting hold of the subject matter as it occurs in nature. The exact form of guidance suitable to this age and the exact limitations of experiment are matters depending on experience. But I plead that this period is the true age for the romance of science. Concentration on science. Towards the age of 15, the age of precision in language and of romance in science draws to its close, to be succeeded by a period of generalization in language and of precision in science. This should be a short period, but one of vital importance. I am thinking of about one year's work and I suggest that it would be well decisively to alter the balance of the preceding curriculum. 
there should be a concentration on science and a decided diminution of the linguistic work a year's work on science coming on the top of the previous romantic study should make everyone understand the main principles which govern the development of mechanics physics chemistry algebra and geometry understand that they are not beginning these subjects but they are putting together a previous discursive study by an exact formulation of their main ideas for example take algebra and geometry which i single out as being subjects with which i have some slight familiarity in the previous three years there has been work on the applications of the simplest algebraic formulae and geometrical propositions to problems of surveying or of some other scientific work involving calculations in this way arithmetic has been carefully strengthened by the insistence on definite numerical results and familiarity with the ideas of literal formulae and of geometrical properties has been gained also some minor methods of manipulation have been inculcated there is thus no long time to be wasted in getting used to the ideas of the sciences the pupils are ready for the small body of algebraic and geometrical truth which they ought to know thoroughly furthermore in the previous period some boys will have shown an aptitude for mathematics and will have pushed on a little more besides in the final year somewhat emphasizing their mathematics at the expense of some of the other subjects i am simply taking mathematics as an illustration meanwhile the cycle of language is in its stage of generalization in this stage the precise study of grammar and composition is discontinued and the language study is confined to reading the literature with emphasized attention to its ideas and to the general history in which it is embedded also the time allotted to history will pass into the precise study of a short definite period chosen to illustrate exactly what does happen at an important epoch and also to show how to pass the simpler types of judgments on men and policies i have now sketched in outline the course of education from babyhood to about sixteen and a half arranged with some attention to the rhythmic pulses of life in some such way a general education is possible in which the pupil throughout has the advantage of concentration and of freshness thus precision will always illustrate subject matter already apprehended and crying out for drastic treatment every pupil will have concentrated in turn on a variety of different subjects and will know where his strong points lie finally and this of all the objects to be attained is the most dear to my heart the science students will have obtained both an invaluable literary education and also at the most impressionable age an early initiation into habits of thinking for themselves in the region of science after the age of sixteen new problems arise for literary students science passes into the stage of generalization largely in the form of lectures on its main results and general ideas new cycles of linguistic literary and historical study commence but further detail is now unnecessary 
for the scientist the preceding stage of precision maintains itself to the close of the school period with an increasing apprehension of wider general ideas however at this period of education the problem is too individual or at least breaks up into too many cases to be susceptible of broad general treatment i do suggest nevertheless that all scientists should now keep up their french and initiate the study of german if they have not already acquired it university education i should now like if you will bear with me to make some remarks respecting the import of these ideas for a university education the whole period of growth from infancy to manhood forms one grand cycle its stage of romance stretches across the first thousand years of life its stage of precision comprises the whole school period of secondary education and its stage of generalization is the period of entrance into manhood for those whose formal education is prolonged beyond the school age the university course or its equivalent is the great period of generalization the spirit of generalization should dominate a university the lectures should be addressed to those to whom details and procedure are familiar. That is to say, familiar at least in the sense of being so congruous to pre-existing training as to be easily acquirable. During the school period, the student has been mentally bending over his desk. At the university, he should stand up and look around. For this reason, it is fatal if the first year at university be frittered away in going over the old work in the old spirit. At school, the boy painfully rises from the particular towards glimpses at general ideas. At the university, he should start from general ideas and study their applications to concrete cases. A well-planned university course is a study of the wide sweep of generality. I do not mean that it should be abstract in the sense of divorce from concrete fact, but that concrete fact should be studied as illustrating the scope of general ideas. Cultivation of mental power. This is the aspect of university training in which theoretical interest and practical utility coincide. Whatever be the detail with which you cram your student, the chance of his meeting in afterlife exactly that detail is almost infinitesimal. And if he does meet it, he will probably have forgotten what you taught him about it. The really useful training yields a comprehension of a few general principles with a thorough grounding in the way they apply to a variety of concrete details. In subsequent practice, the man will have forgotten your particular details, but they will remember by an unconscious common sense how to apply principles to immediate circumstances. Your learning is useless to you till you have lost your textbooks, burned your lecture notes, and forgotten the minutiae which you learned by heart for the examination. What, in the way of detail, you continually require will stick in your memory as obvious facts like the sun and moon and what you casually require can be looked up in any work of reference the function of a university is to enable you to shed details in favor of principles 
when I speak of principles, I am hardly even thinking of verbal formulations. A principle which has thoroughly soaked into you is rather a mental habit than a formal statement. It becomes the way the mind reacts to the appropriate stimulus in the form of illustrative circumstances. Nobody goes about with his knowledge clearly and consciously before him. Mental cultivation is nothing else than the satisfactory way in which the mind will function when it is poked up into activity. Learning is often spoken of as if we are watching the open pages of all the books which we have ever read and then when occasion arises we select the right page to read aloud to the universe. Luckily, the truth is far otherwise from this crude idea, and for this reason the antagonism between the claims of pure knowledge and professional acquirement should be much less acute than a faulty view of education would lead us to anticipate. I can put my point otherwise by saying that the ideal of a university is not so much knowledge as power. Its business is to convert the knowledge of a boy into the power of a man. The Rhythmic Character of Growth I will conclude with two remarks which I wish to make by way of caution in the interpretation of my meaning. The point of this address is the rhythmic character of growth. The interior spiritual life of man is a web of many strands. They do not all grow together by uniform extension. I have tried to illustrate this truth by considering the normal unfolding of the capacities of a child in somewhat favorable circumstances, but otherwise with fair average capacities. Perhaps I have misconstrued the usual phenomena. It is very likely that I have so failed, for the evidence is complex and difficult. But do not let any failure in this respect prejudice the main point which I am here to enforce. It is that the development of mentality exhibits itself as a rhythm involving an interweaving of cycles, the whole process being dominated by a greater cycle of the same general character as its minor eddies. Furthermore, this rhythm exhibits certain ascertainable general laws which are valid for most pupils and the quality of our teaching should be so adapted as to suit the stage in the rhythm to which our pupils have advanced. The problem of a curriculum is not so much the succession of subjects, for all subjects should in essence be begun with the dawn of mentality. The truly important order is the order of quality which the educational procedure should assume. My second caution is to ask you not to exaggerate into sharpness the distinction between the three stages of a cycle. I strongly suspect that many of you, when you heard me detail three stages in each cycle, say to yourself, how like a mathematician to make such formal divisions? I assure you that it is not mathematics but literary incompetence that may have led me into the error against which I am warning you. Of course, I mean throughout a distinction of emphasis, of pervasive quality, romance, precision, generalization, are all present throughout. But there is an alteration of dominance, and it is this alteration which constitutes the cycles.
End of The Rhythm of Education by Alfred North Whitehead The Samphire Gatherer by W. H. Hudson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Samphire Gatherer At sunset, when the strong wind from the sea was beginning to feel cold, I stood on the top of the sand hill, looking down at an old woman hoeing about over the low damp ground beneath a bit of sea flat divided from the sea by the ridge of sand and i wondered at her because her figure was that of a feeble old woman yet she moved i had almost said flitted over that damp level ground in a surprisingly swift light manner pausing at intervals to stoop and gather something from the surface but I couldn't see her distinctly enough to satisfy myself. The sun was sinking below the horizon, and that dimness in the air and coldness in the wind at day's decline, when the year too was declining, made all objects look dim. Going down to her, I found that she was old, with thin grey hair on an uncovered head, a lean dark face with regular features, and grey eyes that were not old, and looked steadily at mine affecting me with a sudden mysterious sadness for they were unsmiling eyes and themselves expressed an unutterable sadness as it appeared to me at the first swift glance or perhaps not that as it presently seemed but a shadowy something which sadness had left in them when all pleasure and all interest in life forsook her with all affections and she no longer cherished either memories or hopes. This may be nothing but conjecture or fancy, but if she had been a visitor from another world, she could not have seen more strange to me. I asked her what she was doing there so late in the day, and she answered in a quiet, even voice, which had a shadow in it too, that she was gathering samphire of that kind which grows on the flat saltings and has a dull green leek-like fleshy leaf at this season she informed me it was fit for gathering to pickle and put by for use during the year she carried a pail to put it in and a table knife in her hand to dig the plants up by the roots and she also had an old sack in which she put every dry stick and chip of wood she came across she added that she had gathered samphire at this same spot every august end for very many years i prolonged the conversation questioning her and listening with affected interest to her mechanical answers while trying to fathom those unsmiling unearthly eyes that looked so steadily at mine and presently as we talked a babble of human voices reached our ears and half turning we saw the crowd or rather procession of golfers coming from the golf house by the links where they had been drinking tea ladies and gentlemen players forty or more of them following in a loose line in couples and small groups on their way to the golfers hotel a little further up the coast a remarkably good-looking lot with well-fed happy faces well-dressed and in a merry mood all freely talking and laughing some were staying at the hotel and for the others a score or so of motor-cars were standing before its gates to take them inland to their homes or to houses where they were staying we suspended the conversation while they were passing us within three yards of where we stood and as they passed the story of the links where they had been amusing themselves since luncheon time came into my mind the land there was owned by an old an ancient family they had occupied it so it is said since the conquest but the head of the house was now poor having no house property in london no coal mines in wales no income from any other source than the land the twenty or thirty thousand acres let for farming even so he would not have been poor strictly speaking 
but for the sons who preferred a life of pleasure in town where they probably had private establishments of their own at all events they kept race horses and had their cars and lived in the best clubs and year by year the patient old father was called upon to discharge their debts of honour it was a painful position for so estimable a man to be placed in and he was much pitied by his friends and neighbours who regarded him as a worthy representative of the best and oldest family in the county but he was compelled to do what he could to make both ends meet and one of the little things he did was to establish golf links over a mile or so of sand hills lying between the ancient coast village and the sea and to build and run a golfer's hotel in order to attract visitors from all parts in this way incidentally the villagers were cut off from their old direct way to the sea and deprived of those barren dunes which were their open space and recreation ground and had stood them in the place of a common for long centuries they were warned off and told that they must use a path to the beach which took them over half a mile from the village and they had been very humble and obedient and had made no complaint indeed the agent had assured them that they had every reason to be grateful to the overlord since in return for that trivial inconvenience they had been put to they would have the golfers there and there would be employment for some of the village boys as caddies nevertheless i had discovered that they were not grateful but considered that an injustice had been done to them and it rankled in their hearts i remembered all this while the golfers were streaming by and wondered if this poor woman did not like her fellow villagers cherish a secret bitterness against those who had deprived them of the use of the dunes where for generations they had been accustomed to walk or sit or lie on the loose yellow sands among the barren grasses and had also cut off their direct way to the sea where they went daily in search of bits of firewood and whatever else the waves threw up which would be a help to them in their poor lives if it be so i thought some change will surely come into those unchanging eyes at the sight of all these merry happy golfers on their way to their hotel and their cars and luxurious homes but though i watched her face closely there was no change no faintest trace of ill-feeling or feeling of any kind only that same shadow which had been there was there still and her fixed eyes were like those of a captive bird or animal that gaze at us yet seem not to see us but to look through and beyond us and it was the same when they had all gone by and we finished our talk and i put money in her hand she thanked me without a smile in the same quiet even tone of voice in which she had replied to my question about the samphire i went up once more to the top of the ridge and looking down saw her again as i had seen her at first only dimmer swiftly lightly moving or flitting moth-like or ghost-like over the low flat salting still gathering samphire in the cold wind and the thought that came to me was that i was looking at and had been interviewing a being that was very like a ghost or in any case a soul a something which could not be described like certain atmospheric effects in earth and water and sky which are ignored by the landscape painter to protect himself he cultivates what is called the sloth of the eye he thrusts his fingers into his ears so to speak not to hear that mocking voice that follows and mocks him with his miserable limitations he who seeks to convey his impressions with a pen is almost as badly off the most he can do in such instances as the one related is to endeavour to convey the emotion evoked by what he has witnessed let me then take the case of the man who has trained his eyes or rather whose vision has unconsciously trained itself to look at every face he meets to find in most cases something however little of the person's inner life such a man could hardly walk the length of the strand and fleet street or of oxford street without being startled at the sight of a face which haunts him with its tragedy its mystery the strange things it has half revealed but it does not haunt him long another arresting face follows and then another 
and the impressions all fade and vanish from the memory in a little while but from time to time at long intervals once perhaps in a lustrum he will encounter a face that will not cease to haunt him whose vivid impression will not fade for years it was a face and eyes of that kind which i met in the samphire gatherer on that cold evening but the mystery of it is a mystery still end of the samphire gatherer by w h hudson A ball player's career, being the personal experiences and reminiscences of Adrian C. Anson, late manager and captain of the Chicago Baseball Club, 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Martin. A Ball Player's Career Chapter 3 Some Facts About the National Game Just at what particular time the baseball fever became epidemic in Marshalltown, it is difficult to say, for the reason that, unfortunately, all of the records of the game there, together with the trophies accumulated, were destroyed by a fire that swept the place in 1897 and that also destroyed all of the files of the newspapers then published there. The fever had been raging in the East many years previous to that time, however, and had gradually worked its way over the mountains and across the broad prairies until the sport had obtained a foothold in every little village and hamlet in the land. Before entering further on my experience, it may be well to give here and now a brief history of the game and its origin. When and where the game first made its appearance is a matter of great uncertainty. But the general opinion of the historians seems to be that by some mysterious process of evolution it developed from the boys' game of more than a century ago, then known as, quote, one old cat, unquote, in which there was a pitcher, a catcher, and a batter. John M. Ward, a famous baseball player in his day, and now a prosperous lawyer in the city of Brooklyn, and the late Professor Proctor, carried on a controversy through the columns of the New York newspapers in 1888, the latter claiming that baseball was taken from the old English game of, quote, rounders, unquote, while Ward argued that baseball was evolved from the boys' game, as above stated, and was distinctly an American game, he plainly proving that it had no connection whatever with rounders. The game of baseball probably owed its name to the fact that bases were used in making its runs, and were one of its prominent features. There seems to be no doubt that the game was played in the United States as early, at least, as the beginning of the present century, for Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes declared a few years ago that baseball was one of the sports of his college days, and the autocrat of the breakfast table graduated at Harvard in 1829. Along in 1842, a number of gentlemen, residents of New York City, were in the habit of playing the game as a means of exercise on the vacant lot at the corner of 4th Avenue and 26th Street, where Madison Square Garden now stands. In 1845 they formed themselves into a permanent organization known as the Knickerbocker Club, and drew up the first code of playing rules of the game, which were very simple as compared with the complex rules which govern the game of the present time, and which are certainly changed in such a way as to keep one busy in keeping track of them. The grounds of this parent organization were soon transferred to the Elysian Fields at Hoboken, New Jersey, where the Knickerbockers played their first match game on June 19, 1846 their opponents not being an organized club, but merely a party of gentlemen who played together frequently, and styled themselves the New York Club. The New Yorks won easily in four innings, the game in those days being won by the club first making twenty-one runs on even innings. The Knickerbockers played at Hoboken for many years, passing out of existence only in 1882. 
In 1853 the Olympic Club of Philadelphia was organized for the purpose of playing town ball, a game which had some slight resemblance to baseball. The Olympic Club, however, did not adopt the game of baseball until 1860, and consequently cannot claim priority over the Knickerbockers, although it was one of the oldest ball-playing organizations in existence, and was disbanded only a few years ago. In New England, a game of baseball known by the distinctive title of, quote, the New England game, unquote, was in vogue about fifty years ago. It was played with a small, light ball, which was thrown overhand to the bat, and was different from the New York game, as practiced by the Knickerbockers, Gotham, Eagle, and Empire clubs of that city. The first regularly organized club in Massachusetts, playing the present style of baseball, was the Olympic Club of Boston, which was established in 1854, and in the following year participated in the first match game played in that locality, its opponents being the Elm Tree team. The first match games in Philadelphia, San Francisco, and Washington were played in 1860. For several years the Knickerbocker Club was alone in the field, but after a while similar clubs began to organize, while in 1857 an association was formed which the following year developed into the National Association. The series of rules prepared by a committee of the principal clubs of New York City governed all games prior to 1857. But on January 22, 1857, a convention of clubs was held at which a new code of rules was enacted. On March 10, 1858, delegates from 25 clubs of New York and Brooklyn met and organized the National Association of Baseball Players, which for thirteen successive seasons annually revised the playing rules and decided all disputes arising in baseball. The first series of contests for the championship took place during 1858 and 1859. At that time the Elysian Fields, Hoboken, New Jersey, were the great center of baseball playing, and here the Knickerbockers, Eagle, Gotham, and Empire Clubs of New York City ruled supreme. A rival sprung up, however, in the Atlantic Club of Brooklyn, and its success led to the arrangement of a series of games between selected nines of the New York and Brooklyn Clubs in 1858. In these encounters New York proved victorious, winning the first and third games by the respective scores of 22 to 18 and 29 to 18, while Brooklyn won the second contest by 29 to 8. In October 1861, another contest took place between the representative nines of New York and Brooklyn for the silver ball presented by the New York Clipper, and Brooklyn easily won by a score of 18 to 6. The Civil War materially affected the progress of the game in 1861, 62, and 63, and but little baseball was played, many wielders of the bat having laid aside the ash to shoulder the musket. The Atlantic and Eckford clubs of Brooklyn were the chief contestants for the championship in 1862, the Eckfords then wresting the championship away from the Atlantics, and retaining it also during the succeeding season, when they were credited with an unbroken succession of victories. The champion nine of the Eckford Club in 1863 were Sprague, pitcher, Beach, catcher, Roach, Wood, and Duffy on the bases, Devere, shortstop, and Manolt, Swandell, and Josh Snyder in the outfield. The championship reverted back to the Atlantics in 1864, and they held the nominal title until near the close of 1867, their chief competitors being the Athletics of Philadelphia and the Mutuals of New York City. The Athletics held the nominal championship longer than any other club, and also claimed the credit of not being defeated in any game played during 1864 and 1865, the feat of going through two successive seasons without a defeat being unprecedented at that time in baseball history. The Eckfords of Brooklyn, however, went through the season of 1863 without losing a game, and the Cincinnati Reds, under the management of the late Harry Wright, 
accomplished a similar feat in 1869, the latter at that time meeting all of the best teams in the country both east and west. The Atlantic's champion nine in 1864 and 1865 were Pratt, pitcher, Pierce, catcher, Stark, Crane, and C. Smith on the bases, Calvin, shortstop, and Chapman, P. O'Brien, and S. Smith in the outfield. Frank Norton caught during the latter part of the season, and Pierce played shortstop. The Athletics in 1866 played all of the strongest clubs in the country, and were only twice defeated, once by the Atlantics of Brooklyn, and once by the Unions of Morrisania. The first game between the Atlantics and Athletics for the championship took place October 1st, 1866, in Philadelphia, the number of people present inside and outside the enclosed grounds being estimated as high as 30,000, it being the largest attendance known at the baseball game up to that time. Inside the enclosure the crowd was immense, and packed so close there was no room for the players to field. An attempt was made, however, to play the game, but one inning was sufficient to show that it was impossible, and after a vain attempt to clear the field, both parties reluctantly consented to a postponement. The postponed game was played October 22nd in Philadelphia. The price of tickets was placed at one dollar and upwards, and two thousand people paid the, quote, steep, unquote, price of admission, the highest ever charged for mere admission to the grounds, while five or six thousand more witnessed the game from the surrounding embankment. Rain and darkness obliged the umpire to call the game at the end of the second inning, the victory remaining with the athletics by the decisive totals of thirty-one to twelve. A dispute about the gate money prevented the playing of the decisive game of the season. The unions of Morrisania, by defeating the Atlantics in two out of three games in the latter part of the season of 1867, became entitled to the nominal championship, which, during the next two seasons, was shifted back and forth between the leading clubs of New York and Brooklyn. The Athletics in 1868 and the Cincinnati's in 1869 had, however, the best records of their respective seasons, and were generally acknowledged as the virtual champions. The Athletics of Philadelphia in 1866 had McBride, pitcher, Dockney, catcher, Birkenstock, Reach, and Pike on the bases, Wilkins, shortstop, and Sensenderfer, Fizzler, and Kleinfelder in the outfield. Their nine presented few changes during the next two seasons, Dockney, Birkenstock, and Pike giving way to Radcliffe, Cuthbert, and Barry in 1867, and Schaefer taking Kleinfelder's place in 1868. The Cincinnati Nine in 1869 were Brainerd, pitcher, Allison, catcher, Gould, Sweezy, and Waterman on the bases, George Wright, shortstop, and Leonard, Harry Wright, and McVeigh in the outfield. In 1868, the late Frank Queen, proprietor and editor of the New York Clipper, offered a series of prizes to be contested for by the leading clubs of the country, a gold ball being offered for the champion club, and a gold badge to the player in each position, from catcher to right field, who had the best batting average. The official award gave the majority of the prizes to the athletic club. McBride, Radcliffe, Fizzler, Reach, and Sensenderfer, having excelled in their respective positions of pitcher, catcher, first base, second base, and center field. Waterman, Hatfield, and Johnson of the Cincinnati's excelled in the positions of third base, left field, and right field, and George Wright of the Unions of Morrisania as shortstop. The gold ball was also officially awarded to the Athletics as the emblem of championship for the season of 1868. The Atlantics of Brooklyn were virtually the champions of 1870, being the first club to deprive the Cincinnati Reds of the prestige of invincibility which had marked their career during the preceding season. The inaugural contest between these clubs in 1870 took place June 14th 
on the Capitoline grounds at Brooklyn, New York, the Atlantics then winning by a score of 8-7 to seven, after an exciting struggle of 11 innings. The return game was played September 2nd in Cincinnati, Ohio, and resulted in a decisive victory for the Reds by a score of 14-3. to three. This necessitated a third or decisive game, which was played in Philadelphia October 6th, and this the Atlantics won by a score of 11-7. to seven. The Atlantics in that year had Zedline, pitcher, Ferguson, catcher, Start, Pike, and Smith on the bases, Pierce, shortstop, and Chapman, Hall, and McDonald on the outfield. The newspapers throughout the country had, by this time, begun to pay unusual attention to the game, and the craze was spreading like wildfire all over the country, every little country town boasting of its nine, and as these were for the greater part made up of home players, local feeling ran high, and the doings of, quote, our team, unquote, furnished the chief subject of conversation at the corner grocery, and wherever else the citizens were wont to congregate. With the advent of the professional player, the game in the larger towns took on a new lease of life, but in the smaller places where they could not afford the expense necessary to the keeping of a first-class team, it ceased to be the main attraction, and interest was centered in the doings of the teams of the larger places. That the professional player improved the game itself goes without saying, as being a business with him instead of a pastime, and one upon which his daily bread depended, he went into it with his whole soul, developing its beauties in a way that was impossible to the amateur, who could only give to it the time that he could spare after the business hours of the day. This was the situation at the time that I first entered the baseball arena, and, looking back, when I come to compare the games of those days with the games of today, and note the many changes that have taken place, I cannot but marvel at the improvement made and at the interest that the game has everywhere excited. End of chapter 3 Recording by David Martin A Talk About Begonias by M. D. Welcome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. A Talk About Begonias by M. D. Welcome. My first begonia was a Rex. It thrived for several years, and then, to my regret, died for it was quite a favorite with me. Its large leaves, with broad silvery belt and red dots, were very handsome. This species thrive best in a wardian case and are of rare beauty and size, grown under such circumstances. A cool, moist atmosphere is the best for them. They burn and shrivel, exposed to the intense sunlight. They are easily multiplied from the leaves. Cut the leaf so that a small portion of the stem will remain. Insert this in a pan of damp sand, laying the leaf out flat upon the sand, upper side uppermost. It can be retained in place by bits of stone or small pegs. Cuts must then be made in a number of places so as to sever the veins, thus checking the flow of sap. A callus then forms at the base of each piece of vein where severed, and just above it a bud starts out, and thus a new plant is formed. It is essential for success that there should be bottom heat, and that the air should be moist. A bell glass is the best to put over the leaf, and if there is danger that the air becomes too moist, the glass can be tilted up to allow of an escape. The leaves best adapted for propagation are those neither very young nor very old, but healthy and vigorous. Yet that this is not absolutely essential is shown by the experience of a lady who had excellent success with a leaf that was somewhat decayed around the edges, and for that reason was cut off and thrown away. 
Remembering afterward that the plant was sometimes grown from pieces of a leaf, she hunted it up, trimmed off the decayed portion, and planted it at the foot of a tree, about half underground, and pressed the soil firmly around it. A few months afterward, she had a nice little plant from it, with its beautiful leaves unfolding finely. There are many varieties of the Rex family. Some have brilliant colors in their leaves. Others are thickly covered with short hairs. These are more difficult to manage and require great care to preserve from dust, as like all rough-leaved plants, they do not enjoy spraying, as do some smooth-leaved ones. It is well to set them out in a mild shower occasionally. Tepid water is the best for watering. Begonias not rex. This class are the most generally cultivated, and they embrace a great many varieties, which are especially distinguishable by the diversity of their leaves. Most of them are one-sided, that is, they are larger on one side of the midrib than on the other. Some have fern-like foliage, others lobated. Some have very large palmate leaves, others are spotted and laced with white. As a class, they are very beautiful for their foliage, but when to this attraction is added beauty of flowers, it will be seen at once that they are eminently deserving of the prominent position now given them both in the open border and the window garden. We will name, for the benefit of amateurs, some of the most desirable as given by Mr. Vick. Fuchiodes, with its drooping scarlet flowers, is one of the most desirable of the whole class. The leaves are small and of a dark green color, and the small, delicate, brilliant flowers are produced in great profusion. As a winter blooming sort, it is indispensable. F. Alba bears white flowers. Richardson Oni, a variety with white flowers and deeply cleft palmate leaves, requires more heat than the former, therefore well adapted to our warm rooms. Subpeltata nigricans has large, dark purple leaves and bears clusters of large rosy flowers, very ornamental. Grandiflora rosea with light pink flowers and Sandersoni scarlet flowers. Weltoniensis of dwarf habit and small dark green foliage, rich pink flowers, are all fine winter bloomers. Argyro stigma picta has long thick leaves with white spots. Metallica, an elegant plant with bronzy green foliage and producing an abundance of pale peach-colored flowers is a very recent introduction. Louis Schwatzer has a beautiful marked foliage in the style of Rex, dwarf habit. Mons, Victor Lemoine, leaves marbled like lace. Glaucophila scandens is of quite recent introduction, and the very best of all for a hanging basket. It is of a drooping habit, and its bright glossy leaves are very handsome. It bears large panicles of orange salmon flowers. Tuberous rooted begonia. This is a class of quite recent origin, and differs from the more general varieties, in that it has bulbous roots which can be taken up and stored during the winter, like gladioli and gloxinia bulbs. It has larger flowers than the other species, red, orange, yellow, with intermediate tints. A writer in the London Garden says of them, The bulbous begonias, mostly of the Bolobiniensis and Vieche sections or families, may have also a brilliant future in the flower garden. Meanwhile, their proper place seems to be in the conservatory, greenhouse, and window garden. For such positions, it is well-nigh impossible to match the bulbous-rooted begonias for brilliancy, grandeur, and grace, three qualities seldom combined in the same plant. The plants are also characterized by great distinctness and freshness of style and character. They are both double and single. Of the single-flowered, the most important sent out last year was Davisi. It is a native of the Andes of Peru dwarf in habit, the leaves and flowers all springing from the rootstock. 
escapes which rise erect above an elegant bluish-green foliage are light red each scape bears three dazzling scarlet flowers the plant is of very free growth and a profuse bloomer frobelli a new species from ecuador said to be very attractive producing well above the foliage erect branches of large brilliant scarlet flowers the foliage is of bright green furnished on the underside with a thick covering of white hairs white queen a very elegant variety with numerous racemes of ivory white blossoms of the new double-flowered glory de nancy is represented as a magnificent variety with large very double carmine flowers and very floriferous louis van holt flowers large of a crimson scarlet color of fine habit and a free bloomer comtesse horace chouteau is an inch or more in diameter very double and of a delicate soft shade of rose the young plant in a three inch pot presented a number of flowers and buds indicating a good blooming habit as a double flower it is remarkably fine the petals being well formed pretty smoothly laid and imbricated james Vick. the soil best adapted for begonias is turfy loam leaf mold sand and old well rotted manure in equal parts when growing they require a liberal supply of water applied directly to the soil the begonias are natives of the tropical countries of asia africa and america and most of them inhabit the mountainous regions at a considerable elevation they were first brought to notice and introduced into cultivation about two hundred years ago by a french naval officer michel bigon from whom they derived their name end of talk about begonias by m d welcome a tribute to the birth of a nation by rupert hughes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org when a great achievement of human genius is put before us we can become partners in it in a way by applauding it with something of the enthusiasm that went into its making it is that sort of collaboration that i am impelled to attempt in what follows when i saw the birth of a nation the first time i was so overwhelmed by the immensity of it that i said it makes the most spectacular production of drama look like the work of village amateurs it reduces to childishness the biggest things the theater can do for here were hundreds of scenes in place of four or five thousands of actors in place of a score armies in landscapes instead of squads of supers jostling on a platform among canvas screens here was the evolution of a people the living chronicle of a conflict of statesmen a civil war a racial problem rising gradually to a puzzle yet unsolved here were social pictures without number short stories adventures romances tragedies farces domestic comedies here was a whole art gallery of scenery of still life and life in wildest career here were the portraits of things of furniture of streets homes wildernesses pictures of conventions cabinets senates mobs armies of flower gardens hypocrisy and passion ecstasy and pathos pride and humiliation rapture and jealousy flirtation and anguish devotion and treachery self-sacrifice and tyranny 
Here were the Southerners in their wealth, with their luxury at home, their wind swept cotton fields. Here was the ballroom with the seethe of dancers. Here were the soldiers riding away to war and the soldiers trudging home defeated with poverty ahead of them and new and ghastly difficulties arising on every hand here was the epic of a proud brave people beaten into the dust and refusing to stay there the picture shifted with unending variety from huge canvases to exquisite miniatures now it was a little group of refugees cowering in the ruins of a home a shift of the camera and we were looking past them into a great valley with an army fighting its way through one moment we saw abraham lincoln brooding over his emancipation proclamation another and he was yielding to a mother's tears later we were in the crowded theater watching the assassin making his way to and from his awful deed the leagues of film uncoiled and poured forth beauty of scene and face and expression beauty of fabric and attitude and motion the birth of a nation is a choral symphony of light light in all its magic the sun flashing through a bit of brown black lace and giving immortal beauty to its pattern a quivering in a pair of eyes or on a snowdrift of bridal veil or on a moonlit brook or a mountainside superb horses were shown plunging and rearing or galloping with a heart-quickening glory of speed down road and lane and through flying waters now came the thrill of a charge or of a plunging speed caught back on its haunches in a sudden arrest now followed the terror of a bestial mob the hurrah of a rescue streets filled with panic and with carnival life is motion and here was the beautiful moving monument of motion what could the stage give to rival all this i thought what could the novel give or the epic poem the stage can publish the voice and the actual flesh yet from the film these faces were eloquent enough without speech and after all when we see people we are merely receiving in our eyes the light that beats back from their surfaces we are seeing merely photographs and moving pictures i had witnessed numberless photoplays unrolled pictures of every sort and condition of interest and value i had seen elaborate feature films occupying much time and covering many scenes but none of them approached the unbroken fascination of the birth of a nation the realism of this work is amazing merely sit at a window and actually rolls by the grandeur of mass and the minuteness of detail are unequaled in my experience and so the first impression of my first view of this was that it was something new and wonderful in dramatic composition and in artistic achievement in his novel the clansman the reverend thomas dixon had made a fervid defense of his people from the harsh judgments and condemnations of unsympathetic historians with his book as a foundation david w griffith built up a structure of national scope and of heroic proportions of course size has little to do with art a perfect statuette like one of the exquisite figurines of tanagra is as great in a sense as the cathedral of rhymes a flawless sonnet of milton's 
need not yield place to his paradise lost a short story of poe's has nothing to fear from a cycle of dumas novels nor has the suwanee river anything to fear from the wagnerian tetralogy and yet we cannot but feel that a higher power has created the larger work since the larger work includes the problems of the smaller and countless others the larger work compels and tests the tremendous gifts of organization coordination selection discipline climax one comes from this film saying i have done the south a cruel injustice they are all dead these cruelly tried people but i feel now that i know them as they were not as they ought to have been or might have been but as they were as i should probably have been in their place i have seen them in their homes in their pride and their glory and i have seen what they went back to i understand them better and after all what more vital mission has narrative and dramatic art than to make us understand one another better hardly anybody can be found today who is not glad that slavery was wrenched out of our national life but it is not well to forget how and why it was defeated and by whom what it cost to tear it loose or what suffering and bewilderment were left with the bleeding wounds the north was not altogether blameless for the existence of slavery nor was the south altogether blameworthy for it or for its aftermath the birth of a nation is a peculiarly human presentation of a vast racial tragedy there has been some hostility to the picture on account of an alleged injustice to the negroes i have not felt it and i am one who cherishes a great affection and profound admiration for the negro he is enveloped in one of the most cruel and insoluble riddles of history his position is the most difficult since those who most ardently endeavor to relieve him of his burdens are peculiarly apt to increase them the birth of a nation presents many lovable negroes who win hearty applause from the audiences it presents also some exceedingly hateful negroes but american history has the same fault and there are bad whites also in this film as well as virtuous it is hard to see how such a drama could be composed without the struggle of evil against good furthermore it is to the advantage of the negro of today to know how some of his ancestors misbehaved and why the prejudices in his path have grown there surely no friend of his is to be turned into an enemy by this film and no enemy more deeply embittered the birth of a nation is a chronicle of human passion it is true to fact and thoroughly documented it is in no sense an appeal to lynch law the suppression of it would be a dangerous precedent in american dramatic art if the authors are never to make use of plots which might offend certain sects sections professions trades races or political parties then creative art is indeed in a sad plight uncle tom's cabin has had a long and influential career perhaps no book ever written exerted such an effect on history it was denounced with fury by the south as a viciously unfair picture it certainly stirred up feeling and did more than perhaps any other document to create and set in motion the invasion and destruction of the southern aristocracy 
Yet it was not suppressed because of its riot provoking tendencies. And it is well that it was not suppressed. The birth of a nation has no such purpose. It is a picture of a former time. All its phases are over and done, and most of the people of its time are in their graves. But it is a brilliant, vivid, thrilling masterpiece of historical fiction. Thwarting its prosperity would be a crime against creative art and a menace to its freedom. The suppression of such fictional works has always been one of the chief instruments of tyranny and one of the chief dangers of equality. I saw the play first in a small projecting room with only half a dozen spectators present. We sat mute and spellbound for three hours. When I learned that it had been materially condensed, it seemed a pity to destroy one moment of it. The next time I saw it in a crowded theater, and it was accompanied by an almost incessant murmur of approval and comment, roars of laughter, gasps of anxiety and outburst of applause. It was not silent drama so far as the audience was concerned. The scene changed with the velocity of lightning, of thought. One moment we saw a vast battlefield with the enemies like midgets in the big world. The next we saw some small group filling the whole space with its personal drama. Then just one or two faces big with emotion and always a story was being told with every device of suspense, preparation, relief, development, and crisis. I cannot imagine a human emotion that is not included somewhere in this story, from the biggest national psychology to the littlest whim of a petulant girl, from the lowest depths of ruthless villainy to the utmost grandeur of patriotic ideal. All of the seven wonders of the world were big things. I feel that David W. Griffith has done a big thing, and he has a right to the garlands as well as the other emoluments. The Birth of a Nation is a work of epical importance in a large and fruitful field of social endeavor in paying it this tribute of profound homage, I feel that I am doing only my duty by American art, merely rendering unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. End of a Tribute to the Birth of a Nation by Rupert Hughes Read by Chuck Williamson